Thank you for joining us on our journey here to preserve the history of mixed martial arts. When I wanted to take on this project, I needed help. I brought in one of my favorite matchmakers, Miguel Iterate, and the MMA detective, Mike Davis. So to do this, we've been able to preserve history. Welcome and enjoy. Hey, Miguel Iterate here for the Lights Out podcast. And uh, Chris Lytle is off in bare knuckle land. And uh, he sent us some instructions and we got a bare knuckle conversation coming up. And we got plus on that. You know, we're going to talk to Jason Knight. He's joined us here. Uh, had his uh, recent run in bare knuckle, had his UFC run. Mike's going to take over here. And we're going to go through his career. I'm not sure what direction we're going to go in, but we're very happy to have Jason Knight, a two-sport athlete. Yeah. So, Jason, welcome to the show. First and foremost, BKFC 5, it was probably the second or third time I've seen you fight live. It's in your hometown. You fight Artem Lobov. It's an absolute, anybody that follows our podcast, it's an absolute legendary combat sport moment. How does that fight come together? Ah, uh, man, it, it wasn't long after I got released from the UFC. Uh, whenever I got released, the the UFC they never they never made a post about it never said anything about it uh and you know I just it was like crickets for a while I never said anything I was in the process you know I had a little gym for a while I was in the process of trying to get that all started and uh guy from bjpen.com hit me up you know he said uh hey man can I do an interview? I did an interview or whatever, and they asked me how how important is it to to win your next UFC fight? I was like, uh, obviously not too important. I'm not in the UFC anymore. They cut me, and that was how I got released. Well, wasn't long after that, uh, a guy named Frog. I don't know how he's associated with the bare knuckle world, but uh, he hit me up and he's like, "Hey man, you know, would would you fight bare knuckle?" So like, yeah, you know, I might be down for that. Told him, uh, you know, put people in contact with my manager. And then next thing you know, David Feldman reached out to – I said – I didn't have a manager at the time. I, it was my coach. Told him, tell David Feldman, get up with my coach. He gets up with my coach, and then next thing you know, they asked, do I want to fight Artem Lobov? I said, well, hell yeah, you know, I, I'll smash Artem Lobov. If, you know, that's what I was thinking. I'll kill him. You know, I, I, I thought that it was going to be an easy fight. And then mm – -hmm. uh, you know, one thing led to another, and then we're signing contracts, and we're in the fight. But, uh, yeah, man, that's that right there. That's by far my absolute favorite fight ever. You know, by looking at us, you wouldn't think that would be anybody's favorite fight. But if you uh, if you ask Artem, I guarantee you that's his favorite fight as well. You know, it's, as a fighter, you want that kind of war just, you know, just once in your career. You don't want to walk away like that more than once, you know, but uh, just just one good one like that, and just to cement your legacy, I guess. Which uh, you know, go go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no problem. I, mean, I wanted to ask you. So the first one is your favorite one, or the yeah, totality? yeah, BKF, BKFC five. Whenever we both got blooded and bruised and battered, and you know. It just showed it showed both of our heart, our fighting spirit, our fighting spirit, our toughness. You know, it didn't really didn't really show much skill. Uh, I had no, trained was, so. Yeah. Go, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just saying it was from the heart, and we could see that. It's interesting. What I'm pointing out before I give you the floor again is that you like the fight that you lost, and you actually went back and beat him. But that's not the one you remember fondly. It's interesting. Yeah, man, uh, the, the thing about it, I, I trained so hard for that first fight, you know, and I had I had the same exact skills that I brought into the second fight. I, I absolutely was just as good. I was just as prepared, but it was something about the animosity. You know, we, we talked so much trash before that fight, and I He's went in your from, hometown. He's in your yeah, hometown. Man, yeah, we talked oh, so much trash back away. and forth to each other before the first fight, and it went from, you know, being smart, trying to technically kill him, to I just wanted to kill him. You know, I wanted instead of trying to, instead of trying to 
make him miss, make him pay, make him, you know, uh, fight my game plan. It was just I'm I'm lighting into him. I'm walking through whatever he gives me, and I'm giving him twice as much back. You know, that was my mind frame. I was going to take everything he had, and he wasn't going to be able to take everything I had. But little did I know, Artem was just as tough as I was, you know. Well, well, here's the thing. The venue was electric. It was electric. Like you could, you could cut the tension in the air and you're not a backstage guy. Like I was ringside for that. And I'm looking at you running around, taking pictures with people and we're four or five fights in. Like you're not, you haven't even taken your street clothes off yet. That, that's it, man. Like, uh, that's one thing I love about fighting in Mississippi, but also one thing I hate about fighting in Mississippi because, you know, if I'm in Mississippi, 100%, it's a Jason Knight crowd always. You know, I've I've got that sewed up. You know, I don't care who I'm fighting. I don't care if it's another Mississippi boy. If they're fighting Jason Knight, the whole crowd is for me. You know, I've done sold most of the tickets on the card, and they're coming there to see me. So, I would be a straight asshole if I didn't go out there and hug a few necks and take a few pictures, kiss a few babies, you know. I would. I, I got to go out there and, and show love to the ones that got me to the point of my career where I'm at. You know, I, I feel like if I didn't have people behind me, I would have quit doing this a long time ago. You know, it's, it's that love and that support that, you know, keeps you driving on. You know, the, the thrill of going out there in front of all your people screaming your name that's what makes you want to do this so bad and so so in that fight how many stitches did you get um i had 12 cuts on my face i had 47 stitches on the outside of my face and that's before they started stitching up inside of my mouth and there's no telling how many i got on the inside of my mouth because i had i had i think three or four cuts that went all the way through I had one that went all the way through, like right here. Uh, one part, I'm not sure which side, but one side of my lip was ripped completely open. I had a cut that went all the way through right here in this direction and a cut that went all the way through straight up and down. Uh, yeah, we we beat each other half to death that fight. I, th- so, I think he had somewhere close to the same amount of stitches. So Chris Lytle, when you talk about that fight, said, you know, afterward, one of the ring personnel came over and tried to hand me some of some of Jason's teeth. <laughs> I, everybody, everybody thinks that I lost more than one tooth. I lost one tooth in that in that fight, um, and it was a it was a tooth that had already had a cavity, and it was it was bad. But yeah, he definitely knocked that one tooth out. But everybody thinks I lost several of them. But, yeah, uh, I lost one, and I believe it was second round. But uh, that just – that fueled the fire even more. You know, I was ready to kill him for knocking out my tooth. (laughs) Wow, he did you a favor, you know, if it's got cavities. That's (laughs) it, yeah. Got rid of the cavity. So, so was it hard going into the rematch then? Because I see that you were at hometown. But was it hard to trash talk him? Because after a fight like that – it's not unusual that you guys respect each other a little bit. You know what I mean? So, so talk about going into the second fight, why you couldn't get up for it the same way. I uh, meant the rematch was, was so much easier for me, honestly. Uh, there was no animosity. There was no hatred. There was nothing but focus. You know, I was, I was so focused. I had, you know, I had just got saved at that time and I had God in my corner, you know, Every time I would start to get nervous, I would say a little prayer. Dear Lord, please, you know, take the nerves away from me. Please, you know, keep my confidence. Please help me get in there, fight at the best of my abilities. Have my opponent fight at the best of his abilities. And I just, there was, I had a peace about me. I knew that no matter what happened in there, I was going to go in there. I was going to execute my game plan. I was going to make him miss just as many punches as I could make him miss. And every time he missed, I was going to make him pay. And that's what I did. You know, I made him miss a bunch, and I, I peppered him. I peppered him with that jab. I peppered him with the right hand. I never got too crazy, and uh, it it went away excellently. You know, everything went according to plan. Well, the, the couple times that I've seen you fight, 
in Mississippi, there, there is somebody that's, there's a, a gentleman that's in a wheelchair that's always ringside. And you obviously, it's somebody near and dear to you. Um, would you mind explaining that relationship? Yeah, man. I, 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 like I said, I had a little gym in my hometown. And the guy, him and his son came up to the gym. Him, his son, his wife. Um, they all came to the gym and man, I, I love them. I love the kids. I love, I love the whole family. And I, I told him anytime that I can, if there's any way that I can get them up there close, then that's what I'm going to do. And, uh, you know, that I'm a man of my word. So David Feldman, he was nice enough to you know put them inside the barricade and they got to sit there and enjoy the fight. Man, dude. And you know, the, and we're going to move on, but, during the fight, it was so heated in the audience. There was a huge fight in between, right. like rounds three and four, where somebody actually got thrown off a balcony. Yeah, that uh, that was a couple of my best friends. The the one who almost got thrown off the balcony was one of my best friends. Uh, he was up there. He told me the story about it. He said he was up there, and he was rooting me on. Some other guy was rooting Artem on, and they had a few words back and forth. And the next thing you know, the guy started coming towards him. He said, you know, me and all my friends all our life, that's how we've been. You know, if you if you get within arm's reach, you're getting punched. You know, I'm not letting him hit me first. I was raised with that. I, I'm never going to be the guy who gets hit first in a fight. So that's what he did. As soon as the guy got within arm's reach, he popped him a couple times. And then after that, he started getting his ass kicked because the guy, it was a, if you watch, my buddy, he was a little skinny joker. And the, the guy he tried to fight was a big old guy. And uh, he almost got thrown over. And then you see all the people trying to climb up to the top. That was all my friends that were down on the bottom. That was his brother and a couple of our other buddies were down on the bottom trying to climb up. And, yeah, it was, that, it was great. I got to I got to watch that after I got done and got to sit in my hotel room and laugh about that. <laughs> so, all right, you get stitched up afterward. Are you and Artem in the in the hospital together? Uh yeah, I think we passed by each other in the hospital. But um, what's what's insane about that? Neither one of us had a concussion. Neither one of us had broken hands. My hands were three times the size of what they were supposed to be. And I've broken my hands so many times that I knew, you know, they weren't broken. They were just swole up and hurting. You know, I, I could I could squeeze them and tell that there's no broke bones. Well, I get in there and the lady's like, we need to take you to do x-rays on your hands. I was like, my hands aren't broke. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm telling you now, they're broke. I was like, okay, you can x-ray. They look like a cartoon. They look like, look like you got hit in the hand with a hammer on a cartoon. I'm telling you, yeah. I was like, you can x-ray them if you want to, but I'm telling you, they're not broke. Well, we got to get the x-rays. She comes back, and I just kind of look at her. I was like, they're not broke, are they? And she just stormed off all pissed off. I was like, yeah, I told you. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, man, uh, neither one of us had any any real injuries. Uh, I think I was there maybe an hour, you know, just because they, they told me I had to go get X-rays and check for a, con a concussion and everything. I had no concussion, no uh, broken wait, 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 wait. I don't mean to interrupt. We always let our guests talk. Did they ask you and they look at you like car accident? Did you get hit in the head with a couple of bottles at a bar? Like, were they throwing scenarios at you or did? <laughs> no, uh, I, th I think, uh, I think the BKFC kind of already had them, you know, forewarned. Cause when we got there, they already knew what was going on. I still had my hand wraps on and everything. Got you. Yeah. Yeah. That would, uh, <clears throat> that'd be unsettling, you know? So yeah. either, either way, that fight, guys, it is a must-watch TV. And in between the third and fourth rounds, but the th you know, third round, that's when the big fight in the audience happens. And the in entire ringside area is looking at the audience. Meanwhile, you guys are having like a Gotti Ward type type you know fight happening. But that's not where it starts. Jason's story starts when he's 14 years old or 13 or 14 years old, and you meet Alan Belcher. Am I correct on that? Uh, no, you're, you're, you're a little off. See, I was, uh, I, was, I was probably about 13 years old, 
And I was just a bad kid, man. I was getting in street fight after street fight. And um, my sister had a friend of hers living with us, this chick. And she went and told a buddy of mine, he, he's like my brother now, a guy named Jay Bullock. She went and told Jay Bullock about me getting in all these fights and stuff. Well, he wants to teach me how to box. I was like, oh, hell yeah, I want to learn how to box. So I go over there. He starts teaching me how to throw straight punches. You know, uh, in a street fight back in the day, I, I never could throw my left hand. You know, I, it was like, you know, something was wrong with it. I would grab you with the left and I'd punch you with the right. And uh, he started teaching me how to throw straight punches. And then after a month or so, that kind of progressed into, you know, doing a little bit of Muay Thai, doing a little bit of Jiu Jitsu. We're, we're training in my backyard, just out of books and stuff and uh, watching UFC fights, doing whatever we could to try to learn. And then he goes out to a club one night, so a bar called The Whiskey in Mobile, Alabama. And they're passing out flyers for a place called The Fight Club. Well, uh, he brings home this flyer. He says, hey man, uh, you ought to try this. You ought to call them, see if they'll let you try this. I called him up. I was like, look man, I'm 14, can I fight? He said, the guy says, I don't give a shit if you're 12. If your mama signed for it, you can fight. I was like, awesome. And my mama, she, she's always been down. She, you know, if I want to do it, she's going to support it. <laughs> so uh, she takes me up there on Monday, signs me up. I have my first MMA fight uh, that Wednesday. I sign up on Monday. I fight on Wednesday. Well, I go 6-0 and training out of my backyard, fighting in – it was a 16 by 16 boxing ring with a dog kennel over the top of it. Okay. <laughs> Literally, that's all it was. It was a, a dog kennel inside of a boxing ring. Didn't didn't have any rubber coating on the on the wire. <laughs> Every time you get in there, you get scratched the hell up. But I went I went six and zero. Oh. I, I even won a belt. You know, training in the backyard. Wow. But I. Uh, these are other guys that, you know, they're basically walking in off the streets. And anyways, I did that. I got six fights. I'm right at 15 years old, going on 16. And I hear about Alan Belcher has, you know, at the time it was Remix MMA. I hear he's got this gym. So I moved to D'Iberville with my older brother, sign up to his gym. And six months later, I'm fighting for Alan. Um Fought for him four times as an amateur. Whenever I tell we're we're going to go through this. Let me just hit this real quick because you're painting a great picture. First off, your mom. <laughs> oh, yeah. Crazy, bro. I don't even know how, how to phrase a question. You know, but like your mom letting you fight at 14. Would you yeah. say now that you're a father, that's good parenting? Ah. Uh, See, I don't know. See, the thing is, the you thing may need is, it. <laughs> if my kid gets to the point to where you know <laughs> that's just what they want to do, then yeah, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna support them 100. percent But will I guide my kids in that direction? Hell no. Hell no. <laughs> I, I, I got. Do, do you know the name Aaron Riley? UFC veteran Aaron Riley. Yeah, I know that name. Okay, cool. He, he, he fought as a 16-year-old, but with his mother's permission also. And we asked him, similar to this, you know, how, how that went down. And at the end of the day, he said, I got my toughness from my mom. Is, that, is that the case with you? I got every bit of it from my mom, man. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but I, I, I mean, I'm sure you could probably put two and two together. I grew up poor as shit, man. Uh, we, our whole we never life, guessed that. We never guessed I, that. Go ahead. Our life has been, you know, you get a come, you have a come up, you're waiting around for the next setback. You know, if something good goes, there's got to be something bad lurking around the corner. You know, that's how, that's how we've lived our life. And, you know, I wouldn't know any other way to live. You know, I, I know that whatever good comes, the bad's right around the corner. It's always been like that. You, we've, we've always had a struggle. But uh, yeah, to to tell you about a little more about my mom. My first fight, I went in there. I won in like fifty seconds. Then the second fight, they had this guy. He was like six and zero. Oh, he was the champ, and 
they wanted me to go in and do a title well, fight. Well, here, I got it. I got it all lined up. So your first one was on record is Randolph Cole, October twenty fifth, two thousand eight, or was there something before that? I don't know. That was that was before that. The uh, at the time <laughs> when I started, the time when I started fighting MMA in uh, the state of Alabama at the time, they didn't have an athletic commission. So my first six fights were unsanctioned fights. You know what years they were in? Oh. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, it was like 2006 or seven, something like that. Yeah, I was uh, I was 14. Yeah, I I, I it's, let me think. It's 2023, and I'm 30 now. So yeah, 2006, 2007. You got it, Jason. Yeah, you like did that. the math equation. Dude, and, and you, you dropped out of high school to pursue fighting. Am I correct? I, mean, I was I was super good at math. I I had like an A plus in algebra one until I decided I was quitting. But yeah, uh, did that, you leave school? Ah uh, man, I I hated it. Um, I they about the time I got in high school, they uh they decided we were going to have uniforms, and. The teachers, for some reason, they cared more about, you know, making sure you had your uniform on correctly than they did teaching you anything. You know, they, and I, I was a problem child, man. I really was. Uh, I had a problem with authority. If if I went in your class and you was a cool teacher and I liked you, then we had we had a good year. But if I went in your class and you, you crossed me one time, and you were an asshole to me, then I was an asshole to you. And that's just the way I was. You know, if you if you wanted to nitpick every little thing that I did, then I would be a shithead. And that's kind of how I was. And, and also, you know, my I had a big brother that, you know, picked on me from the time I was like three. You know, so by the time I got into school, nobody in this world was going to bully me. You know, you, I don't care if you was bigger. I don't care, you know, if you was more popular, anything. If, if you said the wrong thing, if you did the wrong thing, if you looked at me the wrong way, I was fighting. And my big brother made sure that, you know, no matter what, nobody's ever going to pick on you. You know, I don't care how many ass whoopings you got to take. You're going to take them, but you're not going to back down from anybody. And that's how I was, you know, if, uh, if somebody said something, I was fighting. You know, I got kicked out of school so many times for fighting. And what what ultimately done it for me, I got in a fight, got put in alternative school. While I was in alternative school, I almost got into another fight, got into a verbal altercation. They decided they wanted to expel me. And I told them, you know, I'm never coming back. And that's what I told my mom whenever I got home. I was like, mama. I'm sorry, but I'm not going back. I'll go get my GED, whatever you want to do, but I'm never going back. And I mean, I, I got my GED like a month later after I, I quit. I quit in the 10th grade and never looked back. That's cool. I respect that. Well, here, let's talk about the ultimate events promotions. This is like the first sanctioned event you may have fought in. Randolph Cole. Do you even remember that fight? Oh, yeah. I, I remember still. I remember all of them just about, man. I It's weird. I, I remember all of them just about. Uh, Randolph Cole, that was that was probably the easiest fight I've ever had in my life. You won by submission. Yeah, it was. I think it was first round uh, reverse triangle. So where are you learning your jiu-jitsu from at this point? Uh, by, by that time, I was working with Alan Belcher. I had been at Alan Belcher. <laughs> Um, uh, remix MMA for about six months or so and I believe at that point I was still a white belt I didn't even have you know, my blue belt uh, but I man I picked up on jiu-jitsu super fast uh, that's that's always been you know since I got in the, into a real gym that's kind of was my bread and butter um, stand up came pretty hard for me you know, I was I was tough I could take a beating and you know I give one back but uh, I was never technical. Like, it took me so hard, so, so much, you know, hard work to get to where I was even the least bit technical with my stand-up. Other than that, you know, I would hit you hard, you hit me hard, and I would try to try to bait people into a brawl. And if I could bait you into a brawl, I might win that way. 
But if it was a technical battle, then, you know, I, I usually lose that. And I, I got pretty good at, you know, making people brawl with me because I can beat them there. But if I, if I sit back and try to pick my shots, let them pick their shots, they were better at that. But, you know, now I've kind of got to where I can do that also. Okay. Okay. So ultimate events promotions, what were you getting paid for these fights with them? Uh, actually, but as an amateur, you're not supposed to get paid. Um, and ultimate event promotions was the first time I hadn't got paid. Uh, whenever, whenever I was fighting in the dog kennel for those six fights, if you win, you get a hundred dollars. If you lose, you get nothing. And, uh, yeah, if, if you win, you get a hundred dollars. If you lose, you get nothing. And then once I made it, uh, I found out about the UEP I got with Alan Belcher. I stopped getting paid for the next four fights, you know, uh, my next four amateur fights. Mm -hmm. So it was Randolph Cole, Michael Weddle. Michael Weddle, you knock him out in the second round. Elvis Ravinia, you hit him with an arm bar. And then you line up with Tony Johnson. Tony Johnson, like at that moment, like I had figured uh, – like you're showing, like you're you're showing, like you're a finisher. Was there any, like, were you thinking, like, man, this is where I'm supposed to be. This is my life is going to be. My entire life is going to be centered around this for a good portion of it. Ah, uh, man. By the time, by the time I was probably 15, I knew this is what I wanted to do. Uh, well, yeah, it, it was before I even got to Alan Belcher's gym. Um, you know, I had those six fights. And uh, before I quit school, you know, my teacher, I, I told one of my teachers I was quitting school. I remember like it was yesterday. His name's Coach Pearson, big old fat guy. And uh, I I started falling behind in his class, and he's like, man, you were doing so good. Why are you falling behind? I was like, yeah, man, I'm quitting after this year. He's like, I, okay. Uh, he's like, what are you planning on doing with the rest of your life? He's like, oh, man, I'm going to be a UFC fighter. <laughs> and. That's that reaction you just gave me right there is what he gave me. He died out laughing and he's like, huh, okay, good luck with that. And man, and still to this day, I have not seen Coach Pearson. Like, I would love to see him just so I could be like, hey, dude, remember me telling you that? I, I told you I was going to do that shit, you know? But one uh, in a million. It's one in a million. Yeah, man. That, that, I just, I, for some reason, you know, that's what I had my heart dedicated on. You know, that's what I had. For the longest time, there was no, there was no, any other outcome in my life that would have been acceptable. You know, I, I couldn't have done anything else and been okay with it. So, so, Jason, locally, like in that region at that time, everybody was talking about this young kid that shouldn't be fighting, that is fighting. Obviously, you're aware of that. There was another kid, was it Chilo, was it Pisaric? He was 5-1- Huh? Shiloh Pizzerich. Pizzerich. Shiloh Pizzerich. I had always thought you two were going to meet up as amateurs because the two, like, because you gotta remember, there wasn't many kids. Another person that was a kid fighting, obviously before you, was uh, Carol Parisian. Carol Parisian's dad used to drive him to Mexico. So whenever these children started fighting, they got a little bit more notoriety than the other, pilo, the other people. So I was always surprised that both you and Shiloh never met up. Yeah, man, I don't honestly I don't know why that never happened. Um we were we were not even in the same gym. Yeah, we've trained together a few times throughout the past, but uh Shallow is tough, man. I honestly in my opinion, what I think it was, I think his dad didn't really want that fight because he knew that I was tough and and he was trying to to kind of like make sure Shallow got correct fights which i mean that's what any any coach is supposed to do. you're supposed to pick fights that you think you can win and um i think i think that's kind of what happened i think todd pizzerich his dad i think that he kind of steered him away from that but uh i know shallow personally shallow he would have been down in a heartbeat and he knows you, you know i would have too but oh, uh for sure yeah. never happened. so you mentioned shallow's father todd was your father anywhere on your radar at this point in your life? 
Uh, yeah, man, he uh, he wasn't too much into the fighting and stuff. You know, I, I lived with him off and on uh, from the time I was 15 till I was probably 17 or 18. And then, uh, but but my dad, man, he he was a good guy, good as gold. But he he dabbled a little bit with drugs and alcohol and women and stuff, and wound up he had cirrhosis of the liver and hepatitis C. And it took him on, I think I was, I think I was probably 22 or 23 whenever he died. It was, he died shortly after I got in, in the UFC. He died in a nursing home and a slow, short, I mean, a slow, shitty death, you know. But, um, damn. Yeah, he was, he was around, he was around most of my life. But, um, it was, a, I would say I was probably, 17 or 18 whenever he went he went pretty far downhill because of the cirrhosis and everything you know I, in cases like that love the person but when you've got kids you just try to break the cycle or make some changes you know so that your kids don't have to go through that uh, well if i can my daddy he taught me quite a bit but if i can tell you the most important lesson he ever taught me was don't don't mess that don't mess with none of that shit you know i don't i've never messed with any kind of you know hard drugs or anything you know, i've smoked my pot and stuff but as far as the hard drugs and shit like that i've always left them alone as far as being an alcoholic and gambling you know, i've left all that alone because he, I, I see, he showed me by example what the hell that that path can do to you you know but what well, you don't drink at all am i correct i i do sometimes you know from time to time but as far as like a weekend thing, now nah, I'm good at that. I'll drink once in a blue moon, like a social thing, but I, I never get, I never really get drunk. I, I'll get, I've been drunk quite a bit in my life. Don't let me lie to you, but I, I'll, I'll drink enough to where I know, hey, I got to drive home later, you know, and I, I'll shut myself off. And two hours later, I'll finally leave the bar or whatever, you know. Excellent. So, you turn pro against uh, Patrick Needham. It's the first time you're getting paid. You got L. Belcher in your corner. You got to be kind of riding high that night. Yeah, man. Uh, let me let me go back. Let me go back a little bit, real quick. Before, all right. So, I was gonna tell you about my crazy ass mom. Go, dude. Please, please. All right. Um, <laughs> so, my first fight, I win like. 50 seconds well then second fight they want me to fight this guy he's like six and zero. Oh, he's got the belt and they want me to fight a title fight so basically they're throwing this little 14 year old kid in there to get his ass kicked within a, is, is this person an adult yes he's an adult he's 20 he's 26 i'm 16 I, i'm sorry he's 26 I'm, I'm i just turned 15 and this is before the randolph cole fight Yes, yes. This so none is, of these are documented. None this of these is back documented. in the dog kennel. This is my second fight ever. Okay, cool. Well, uh, <clears throat> anyways, they want me to fight this guy. And this is where I get my nickname is this fight right here, my second fight. I get the name of the kid. The The lady comes in. They want to do a little interview with me. And she's like, uh, what do you want your nickname to be? I was like, hell, I don't know. I was like, you don't give yourself a nickname. You know, other people got to give you the nickname. And she was like, uh, all right, well, hell, we're just going to call you the kid. That's how you are. She said, that's how you are as a damn kid anyways. And I was like, Jason, the kid. And I was like, damn, that sounds pretty good. I was like, we'll go with that. <laughs> so, all right, well, then we go in here, and it's it's three three-minute rounds for the, for the belt. And they're thinking this guy's going to run right through me. I beat his ass all three rounds. I'm gassed out, dead. I beat the hell out of him. Were you counter punching or wrestling? Uh, it was, I was just brawling, man. That was it. I, <laughs> okay. I, I had no real experience. I was okay. just punching my way and kneeing my way. Windmilling? Anything <laughs> I could do to get through there. I, I was. <laughs> anyways, I, I get the win. I know that I'm going to win. But before they ever raise my hand or anything, my mama climbs the cage. She jumps in there with me, giving me a hug and telling me congratulations and raising my hand for me and stuff. And then the referee's like, what are you doing? You can't be in here. 
It's like he won, didn't he? I was like, yeah, but you still can't be in here. And then they announced <laughs> that I won. And, you know, next thing you know, I turn around and, and realize, you know, my crazy ass mama climbed the cage. I thought that she come through the door. And, it, yeah, I didn't even realize that she climbed the cage. But, all right, now, <laughs> skip, to, skip to my tenth fight. Uh, the tenth fight you said a while ago was against uh, Tony, uh, Anthony, Anthony, gotcha. John, whatever. That was the first time I won by Gogo Plata. Yes. I was, wait, wait, it's listed as a KO, but it's actually a Gogo Plata. That's correct. Yes, my my tenth amateur fight I won by Gogo Plata. Um, that was my second belt, the UEP belt. That's the night I won it. The uh, I go in here. I'm a I'm a buck forty two after eating a cheeseburger. I'm skinniest one forty five you ever seen. Well, this guy standing across the cage from me is chiseled. You know, he's he's a mixed guy that is looking like every bit of one seventy. Well, well, he's he's a guy that's five foot seven, like maybe five six, five seven, but he's like wide. Like he's yeah. as wide as he is tall. Yeah, it's like yeah. a refri- little mini refrigerator. Yeah, he's chiseled up, bro. And yeah. I look, I know he is. oh shit, what am I gonna do? You know, like this guy's gonna kill me. Well, we go in there, and I go to tap his glove. But as soon as I tapped his glove, he kicked me. You know, instead, of like, like kind of cheap shot me. He kicked me. I, that pissed me off. So I was like, all right. So I threw a one two. He ducked under and took me down. Well, he took me down, run. You know, landed right in rubber guard. And I remember the reason this is so important, man, the reason I came back to this. I remember, I would say probably a month and a half before this, Alan Belcher was getting to go, getting ready to go and fight uh, Dennis Kane. And he had went and trained with Eddie Bravo a good bit. And right before he leaves to go and train for Dennis Kane, he teaches me this rubber guard. You know, he teaches me a few little submissions from the rubber guard. He's like, man, I really think you're going to like this. Well, he taught me that one day, and he leaves the next day. Never seen me training it, never seen me working it or anything. He just showed it to me. And, man, I worked this shit, and I worked it, and I worked it for that whole month that he was gone. And he comes back, like, the day before my fight, and he's in my corner. Well, the guy takes me down. And automatically, I sink up rubber guard. I sink the go-go plata. Like, 10 seconds into being on the ground, I got the go-go plata sunk in. And I was like, don't let it go, Jake. Don't let it go. And all I could think is like, hell no, man, I got this. You know, And then I, I finished by go-go plata. So, that was that was a, a, a big staple right there, you know, just – One of the most – you know? Dude, it's one of the most difficult submissions to pull off in MMA. Yeah. I, I've got it twice so far in my career. Yeah, yeah. So, Alan Belcher, tell us about your relationship with him. How does I mean, he sees this probably punk kid come through his gym. How do you guys get close? When do you earn his respect? Um, honestly, man, I, I, I don't really know how what he thought about me right at first. I, I'm sure you know because at the time I was still smoking pot and stuff. So I'm sure I walked in there smelling like a big old bag of weed and he's probably thinking, man, this kid, what the hell, you know? Well, uh, I, I would say the time that I believe that he really started taking a liking to me is whenever they started trying to teach me how to check leg kicks. Okay. Well, we're in there sparring and there's a guy named Cody Sensony and he kicked me in my leg and they're telling me, you got to check it. You got to check it. He kicked me, and I'd fall down. I'd get right back up. He kicked me again. I'd fall down. You got to check it. You got to check it. And I'm telling you, this went on for like 10 minutes, it seemed like. It, it was only it was literally only a three-minute round. But I'm talking about this whole three-minute round, he was just kicking my feet out from under me, and I never gave up. Well, then, you know, next thing you know, Alan Belcher's over there showing me how to properly check a leg kick and stuff. I didn't know. They're telling me you got to check it. I'm like, what the hell's checking it? <laughs> look at it. Yeah, you got to look at it. You got to check yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, after that, man, he, he kind of, I, I guess he kind of saying, hey, 
hey, this kid's tough. This kid's serious about this shit. So let's let's show him a few things instead of beating the hell out of him, you know? <laughs> yeah, you're still like so much, so much smaller than than him as well. Yeah, than Belcher. Yeah, oh man, the guy Cody sent me, the one that's kicking my feet out from under me, he was a 170 guy, and at this time oh. I'm still. I'm still walking around at like 140 soaking wet with a cheeseburger in my hand. And like that's that was that was my thing. I was fighting at 145, but I was really like 142. I fought at 145 so that way I didn't have to cut any weight. And I was good with the other guy being a couple pounds bigger or whatever, you know. Wow. Wow. So when do you think Alan and you kind of like solidify your relationship like he accepts you as a fighter um i would say you know probably probably first or second amateur fight that i had with him you know um okay. i had, you know i was uh i was six and oh when i got to the gym you know whenever i got to his gym and i'm i was six and oh with six finishes you know no uh with five out of five out of those six fights from my backyard i had five finishes and and one decision and i'm thinking you know i'm fixing to go to this gym and just wreck everybody you know, i'm i'm a badass well i get to the gym and i start realizing that the weakest looking guy in there was still tougher than i was you know i figured that out quick and then once i get in there with alan alan and all them other guys i started realizing you know hey they're better than me and I started soaking up knowledge automatically. You know, I, I started, I didn't care who it was. If somebody would teach me something, I was there to learn it. And I had nothing to do. I had no job, no nothing, you know, and uh, I was in school. So I would, in the morning times, I would run to the gym and I would train. I would run back home. And in the evening times, I would run to the gym. I would train. I'd run back home. I was doing two to three classes a day, sometimes four every day. And I think that, you know, Alan seen, hey, this kid's serious. So after a couple months, he gets me a fight. Uh, I can't – who you say? Patrick Needham. No, yeah, no, no, Patrick that Needham. Was, that yeah. was my first pro fight. The, the Randolph Cole was uh, my first amateur fight with him. He gets me that fight. I take it serious. I, I beat that guy. I beat the next, you know, four as an amateur. And this is while I'm 16. Well, I remember I was 17. I remember it like it was yesterday, man. We were running. And uh, we was running, getting ready for an amateur fight, for my last amateur fight. And he's like, hey, man, uh, what you think about going pro when you turn 17? I was like, uh, can I do that? Because in the state of Mississippi at the time, you got to be 18 to go pro. You can't go pro at 17. I said, can I do that? He's like, man, I'm good friends with the commission. I talked to him. You know, I showed him some of your videos that, you know, you've been fighting. I told him, I said, this kid's been fighting grown men since he was 14. That's Will crazy. You fight? And uh, again, you know, the commission says, hey, if his mama will sign off on it, she'll sign. You know, I'll let him fight as a pro. Sure enough, my mama, she was down. She signed off. <laughs> well, uh, after that, man, uh, I was I was turning pro for the next fight. And uh, I, fought, I fought a guy named Sean Hayes. Well, no, no, no. No, you, man, that, wasn't my, that wasn't my first pro fight. That was my second, I believe. Second. But so yeah. you fight Needham, you get you win by first round triangle. So your ground game, your triangle game is as solid as it gets. And then the Hayes brothers decide to step up. First is Sean with it uh No Love Entertainment of Rich Clemente's show. Yeah, I believe first round armbar, I believe. That's it. He was three and one at the time. And um was I he mean, a, was he a Rich Clemente student as well? I'm not a hundred percent sure. I'm not. I'm not either. I know. I know that he had trained with Todd Pizzerich and Shallow Pizzerich. But uh, yeah, I I think I beat him in a minute and a half, two minutes maybe. It, it was definitely first round, the first round armbar. And then you, I think his brother is your next fight at Ultimate Event Promotions. You're back with them. It's Darren yeah. Hayes. 
the Darren Hayes and Sean Hayes, they're absolutely no relation. They're not. Yeah, the uh, Sean Hayes, he's a white guy, good buddy of mine. Uh, the Darren Hayes is a, a mixed guy that I've, I've never seen before until that night. Okay. Okay. That's fair. I, I um, think Darren Hayes by triangle choke. So you're finishing everybody. You're going back to the gym. You're king of the world. I mean, the neighborhood has got to be talking about you quite a bit. Oh, yeah, for sure, man. Uh, by the by the time, I would say probably my third or fourth pro fight, I was I was king of Mississippi, it felt like. You know, I, I, I could go to any show anywhere, and I would have a crowd, you know, and that's – I loved it. Let me let me I, ask you if you because you're fighting in Mississippi and you know you're from Biloxi. Were you underage fighting in any casinos? Is that oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, the IP, you, I fought at the IP before I was 18, I believe it. Either before I was 18 or when I was 18, I wasn't 21. I can tell you that. Were you sneaking around playing cards or is no, nah, I wish I could no. have, man. I love some blackjack. Uh, I try my best to stay out of there, though, because uh, the blackjack can be addictive. So I, I try my best to stay away from them casinos. Okay, that's good. That's good that you figured it out early. That's good. Yeah. yeah. Can't turn your pockets inside out, for sure. Real quick. All right. So Ultimate Event Promotions, they line you up with a guy. Okay, so in Florida, the Tampa area – is pretty proficient in like high end gyms. Like there's Rob Khan kind of built it out over there, but there's also a Highlander MMA who I've met the owner a couple of times. I really respect them a lot. They've got a high end product. They throw you up against Ronald Jacobs. That's no yeah. joke, man. Yeah, man. Uh, that was the very first fight out of what was he? Number 14. He was my fourth, uh, my fourth, yeah. man, my fourth pro fight. Yes. Yeah, uh, that fight I thought I was losing. You know, he, I went out there first round, did pretty good against him. What was that? That was a third round triangle choke, correct? Second round triangle. Second round triangle. Well, yeah, I go out there and we did pretty good first round. It, it was tough, man. And uh, I remember at some point in the second round, he was on top of me, and I was like, man, I'm gonna lose. I just, I, I done gassed myself because I, I, I emptied the tank in the first round. And then I'm gassed out in the second. I'm like, man, I'm going to lose this fight. And somehow I pulled off that triangle. And, uh, but yeah, Ron Jacobs was tough, man. I wound up fighting him again later in my career, also. Well, just so people can kind of understand, uh, Jim Allers, he's got a knockout victory over Jim Allers. Yeah, yeah, Ron Jacobs. Ron Jacobs, the truth, man. He's really he ain't no tough. joke, bro. No, like he's Jason. There's guys that make it that are superstars. Then there's guys that build the foundation of the UFC. Guys like yourself, but then there's people that you have to just—they're kind of gauntlets. You have to get through them if you ever want to be somebody. And That's those it. people are incredibly important to the sport of mixed martial arts. You see a guy with 25 fights and he's a 500 fighter, but it's not all one rounders. Like he's taking people deep. That guy is super important in the world of mixed martial arts. Oh yeah, man. If you, if you've got this guy that's fought 25 times and he's been finished, you know, four times, but he's got 12 losses on his record. You're like, Oh man, he's got a 16 and 12 record. Like, oh, well, if you look at those 12 fights and seven of them went to the distance and he, you know, he got finished third round by arm bar or something. You can't count this guy out. No. He, he is durable, man. That's what, no. that's what people don't understand. People will be like, man, his record's so horrible. Why are you even fighting him? Like, are you kidding me? This guy's a veteran. He's been fighting for years and years. He's tougher than this guy that's 6-0 over here. Well, and, well, for sure. And, and, and let me let me add to that. The, the 16 victories that you're saying he had, all of them he was supposed to lose because he isn't a ticket seller. That's, that's 16 right. upsets. No, that's you, right, know, right. You, 
And you know, you know, Jason's right. I mean, the bottom line is, is you offer a guy 16 and 12 to, to a guy 6 and 0 and see how fast his coach turns it down. A hundred percent. Even even the 16 and 12 guy, you offer that to a 10 and 0 guy. His coach is going to be like, hell no, man, we're not fighting that guy. Give me somebody that's like six and four. That's what they're looking for is, you know, fights like that. Yep. Yep. hundred percent, dude. Yeah. You know, that's why our podcast exists. It's conversations like this uh, because it's absolute truth. Um, you, you beat Ronald Jacobs. You, you finish him in a second round. You test your gas tank. That's a, what you refer to as a rite of passage. You have to gas out to see what you're made of. And guess what? You push through when you won. Yeah, I, I call my guys in Tampa about like this this guy in particular. Like, no, nah, man, dude was tough. He's real tough. And, you know, you, you got through it. Fight Force Invitational. Where is that at? Fight Force International. It's FL5. It used to be around uh, Mississippi. Um, Ricky and Rodney Duran, that used to be. The, okay. the big show back in the day. That used to be uh, the – they had the uh, blood in the sand and all that stuff down here, and it used to be you know, the leading MMA promotion on the Gulf Coast for years and years until they just decided to get out of it. So you get through Jonathan Burdine, you knock him out in the first round. Atlas Fights kicks up October 1st, 2011. James Rutherford's 3-0 and out of Port City MMA. From what I understand going into this fight, what people were telling me, you were kind of looked at as the underdog. Yeah, man. Uh, James Rutherford, they they thought for sure that he was going to beat me. And I went in there and I, I told James Rutherford. I, I had trained with him before in the past, and I I knew that I could beat him. I had it in my head that I could beat him, uh, especially after beating Jonathan Burden. Burden or uh, John Burden, everybody thought for sure that, you know, that was going to be a tough fight for me. And I, I even thought it was going to be a tough fight because he had, a, I think he had a good, you know, pretty good record at that time. I'm not sure how many fights, but I, I think he had a pretty extensive record. And I went out there and I, I dominated him. So I knew, you know, in my head, I'm finishing James Rutherford. And uh, I was picking him apart and he shot in for a takedown. I saw a guillotine and it was a deep guillotine. Sean Hayes goes four and one in his last five. He's coming in at seven and three. He's hot. You beat him with the triangle. Bro, you're right. on fire. Hold on one second. All right. I got a little backstory to that fight. Okay. All right. So I beat James Rutherford. And um, Sean Hayes, uh, he wasn't even supposed to be in the picture. I was supposed to be fighting a guy named Matt McCook. Well, Matt you get McCook. Later on. Matt McCook was the champion, so he got injured. Well, whenever Matt McCook gets injured, they throw me and Sean Hayes together for an interim title. All right? So, I go out there. I beat Sean Hayes. I want to say it was – I want to say it was probably third round arm triangle. Second or third round. Yeah, I just got triangle. That's all I got. Yeah, yeah. there's not it a lot was, of record on that. It was it was the arm triangle, and I believe it was third round. You know, we had a we had a pretty decent fight back and forth, and I knew Sean Hayes pretty good at this point, and it, it was a lot like a sparring match, and he was kind of getting the better of me on the feet. I think he even dropped me one time, but I eventually I took him down. I got him with the arm triangle in like the third. Third then, round, uh, four minutes thirty three seconds in. Yep. <laughs> Arm triangle in the third. That's yeah. that's close to be over. Yeah, right at the very end, too. All right, the next fight is Matt Cook, correct? Well, no. After Sean Hayes, Atlas puts you up against Michael Roberts. Oh, yeah. The first time you ever see the bell at the end of the uh, – you, know, you go to a judge's car. It's the first time in your that's career. That's right, bro. That's right. Uh no, I think they have that mixed up. I had I had Mike Roberts before Sean Hayes. I had, I fought Mike, I fought Mike Roberts before Sean Hayes. That was my first loss. 
Yes. Very important. You got to have that. You, you, you have to have, you get, you got to understand what it's like to lose. Yeah. I think I was six or seven and oh, by the time I fought Michael Roberts and, uh, all of them was first round finishes. Every one of them, uh, except for uh, Ronald Jacobs. You know, they were all finishes, though. Every fight I had was finishes, and I was just running through everybody. You know, you got to think about it like this: I'm ten and zero as an amateur. Then I'm like six or seven and zero as a pro, and I think I've been to the distance one time by this point. Uh, my very first, uh, my second fight that. The, the first title that I won, I told you about or whatever. Well, then I get to Mike Roberts, and it is his pro debut. I'm six or seven and oh, and I'm he's thinking, a strong wrestler, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking at this time, like, man, this is gonna be an easy fight. I'm gonna kill this guy, Magic so, Mike. Yeah, leading up to the fight, I'm thinking, yeah, this, this is gonna be easy. So I barely trained, barely trained, didn't do the weight cut correct. And I go in there first round, and in the first round, I judo throw him like six times. I put him in like six different submissions. He fights out of every one of them. And then we stand up to go to the – you know, when the bell goes, we stand up to go to the corner, and I can't hold my arms up. My legs are like spaghetti noodles. I completely gassed myself out because I underestimated this guy. I thought for sure, you know, it's his pro debut. I'm finishing him in the first round. I don't need to train for this. And I, I trained, but I didn't train like I should have. And when we go out to the second round, he's fresh as ever. I'm dead. So second and third round, he just beats the piss out of me. He beat me half to death. I sit there and took a beating, and that was the first real humbling experience that I ever had as a fighter. That's the very last time I've ever underestimated anybody. Yeah. Was it hard going back to the gym after you lost? Oh, no, no, man. Uh, at, it was it was hard not having Mike Roberts for the next fight oh. because you know, I I wanted to kill everybody. <laughs> I went back to the gym and I was ready to go. Uh, but then after the Mike Roberts fight, I wound up fighting Sean Hayes. They had that. some For some reason, that's backwards on my record. Okay. But uh, I fight Sean Hayes. For the interim title, I wind up, I win the interim title. And after I beat him, Matt McCook is supposed to be my next fight. Uh, do you see a Matt McCook anywhere on your sheet? Yeah, so Matt McCook, at this time, he's 9-5. and five. He's actually got a, an armbar win over Alec Caceres, who's a future UFC veteran, once the ultimate fighter. Um, real, you, you fought Alex as well later on. Go ahead. We'll get to that. All right, well, uh Leading up to that fight with Matt McCook, you know, I had just taken this loss, you know, not long ago. I beat Sean Hayes for the interim title, and I have my interim title. He has his real title. And leading up to this fight, he talks so much trash. You know, I'm not supposed to be in there with him. I, I they don't even, he don't even know why they set this fight up. This is going to be so easy for him. A first round finish. He's going to walk right through me. All this stuff. So, man, I trained the hardest I've ever trained. I wanted to kill this guy. And I remember weigh-in day. You know, we got the early morning weigh-ins that, you know, you go in there and, and you step on the scales, get your official weight, and you're able to eat and drink and stuff. And then later on that night, you have a ceremonial weigh-in. Well, at the early morning weigh-ins, my mom is like, hey, y'all take a picture together. And I... I asked the dude, I was like, hey, man, you mind getting a picture for my mom? Well, he gets, I'm talking about nose to nose, like trying to kiss me almost. I was like, whoa, man, I ain't trying to kiss you. And kind of push him back. Well, I think he was, you know, he was trying to get in my head. Well, we go to the ceremonial weigh-ins later on that night, and we get on stage, and we go to square up. And I already knew, you know, he's fixing to come in and try to do the same thing. Well, when he did, I caught him. I caught his face and just gripped it. I'm sure if you look hard enough, you can find that picture somewhere. But I just – I gripped his face, and I knew that I was going to kill him the next day. I just had it in my head that he was going down. Go out there, he throws a kick, and whenever he throws a kick, I hit him with a straight right. He falls. 
I jump on him, start punching him. He gives me his back. I sink the rear naked choke, and it's done in under a minute. And then yeah. from then, yeah. Well, you win your first title. Well, your second title. Third title. Third that's title. My, that's my first pro title. That's my first okay. pro. Bit. I won two as an amateur that. How, how were the promoters at Atlas with you? Oh, they were great, man. Uh, Glenn Matina, I, I owe that guy a lot. Um, I A lot of people don't know this. I'm sure if you look it up, you look hard enough. Um, around the time that I was 20, I believe, I went to prison for nine months for a I was charge. Ask you about that later on, but go ahead. I caught a charge when I was 17, you know, being dumb, taking Xanaxes with a buddy. And caught a robbery charge. Taking well, what? Taking Xanax. Oh. Yeah. So I, I got messed up, caught a robbery charge with a buddy. And I wind up, you know, fast forward. Um, I'm like 19, almost 20. Right at 20, I, I go to prison. And all the while, you know, all this whole time I'm fighting for uh, Glenn Matina. And uh, this this wasn't long after the Matt McCook fight, I believe. I went up, I go to prison and everything. And how long did you go for? Nine months? Nine months. How much yeah. Xanax did you have? Oh no, no, I didn't get caught with the Xanax. I got I got I caught a robbery charge because oh. of the Xanax. I was messed oh, up. That's that. different. That's different. I got yeah. you. I got you. Uh, hanging out with hanging out well, with my buddy. Sometimes those life lessons are very important, oh, yeah, man. man. Man, I that's that's the the worst and best thing that's ever happened to me in my life was you know going to prison. I I missed out on my my oldest daughter. I missed out on most of her first year of life, her first steps, oh. first words, all that good stuff. But at the same time, it taught me a valuable lesson. You know, I, whenever I got out, I left you know all the the friends that I was doing dumb shit with. I left them alone. I stopped doing dumb stuff, and you know. Focused on my career, focused on what I need to be focused on. And the whole time I was locked up, Glenn Matina, you know, he was putting money on my books, sending me cards, him and his wife. The whole time, that's that's the owner of Atlas. Dude, you know, it's what you got to do. I, I know that, you know, at the time I was one of the <laughs> ticket sellers. I know that, you know, keeping me in good faith was a good thing for him, you know, kind of to – kind of keep me and him in good terms. So I've had some people tell me the only reason he was sending you money and stuff is because he knew that, you know, when you get out, you're still going to fight for him or whatever. But no, that's, that's, he's a good dude. He's a good dude. Yeah, his I mean, wife, like he's, who knows well, you're in prison? Who knows what you're going to do when you get out? He's looking out for you, man. Well, yeah, yeah man, no, he, I, I, you'd probably go like, back and fight for him. Even if he didn't send you money, you know? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. Yeah, he wrote me letters. I wrote him letters. Um, and I told him, you know, a month or two before I got out, hey, you know, get me a fight lined up. I'm ready. I've I've been working out in here. I'm ready to go. And uh, <laughs> I get out, and he's Wait, got me. How a was fight. prison life? How was prison life? I mean, it was miserable, bro. Uh, it was it was shit. Uh, where 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 I was, I was in a thing called the RID program. And it's kind of like, kind of like daycare to compared to real prison. You go in there and you stay locked down uh, half the damn day. You'll go to these little classes and stuff. And if you mess up there, you know, if you you're you're in this one zone, and right across the hallway is real prison. So if you mess up and you get your actual sentence. They don't send you home or send you back to court. They send you right across the hallway and you go start your real time. And yeah, so I just, I kept my head down, stayed out of trouble and you went in high school, got it done with, you know, but so, yeah. Uh, wait, were you battling like a Xanax addiction and fighting at the same time? No, man, I was just, I was having fun with buddies is all, you know? Supplementing your income. Okay, that's it. Yeah, that's yeah. It. I was that's just, like, you know, Mike, Mike, I think, I, think, I think he was uh, loaded right. on Xanax and got busted robbing things. Yeah. I don't think he was robbing Xanax, though. 
Were no, you stealing no, no, no. Xanax? You weren't stealing no. pills, right? Oh, Supplementing yeah, his income. Yeah, uh, I try to take a dude's bag because uh, a buddy of mine, you know, he's like, hey, let's get him, let's get him. So on Xanax, I don't know if you've ever taken them, but you can be talked into anything. And my buddy told me to get the bag, so I went and tried to get the bag, you know. And that you're also, your little, you're also just a little slower. <laughs> yeah, big time slower. <laughs> yeah, Xanax does slow you down big time. <laughs> so that explains, you know, I got it, I got it written down right here, the time off. So you you fresh out of prison, and you got Bradley Bradley Collins as your first fight then. That's it. Uh, that's uh yeah. He, you got he good memory, that. Jason. What now? You got a good memory, bro. Oh man, yeah. I I I haven't. I've been punched quite a bit, but not punched enough to to forget all of that. Like <laughs> what what's crazy is, I can't remember, you know, what I walked inside for. But I can still remember stuff like that, you know. That, that's what's weird. <laughs> so Bradley Collins by Armbar. You go back to the gym. Is there kind of like a victory celebration that you're back home? Ah oh, man, yeah. Uh, everybody was just happy to have me back. Uh, it, it was like I never skipped a beat, and I've done that all throughout my career, man. That's like I said, I. I had I had my oldest daughter. She's ten now. I had her whenever I was nineteen, almost twenty. So, most of my career, I've been you know trying to be a family man and a fighter all at the same time. And after I got out of prison, I've told myself I will never miss another anything. Not another birthday, another Christmas, another Halloween, uh, another daddy daughter dance. You know anything. You know, I, and I haven't. I haven't missed shit with my kids. Uh, you know, I get them every other weekend and then as much as I can, you know, aside from that. Right. And uh, that's that's just the the balance is so hard, you know, trying to, to make sure that you do everything you're supposed to do and and put in the work that you're supposed to put in. And sometimes it was just all, all get so frustrating. I would take. You know, I'd win a fight and then I'd take three months off. I, you know, I told my, I tell myself I'm going to take a week off. And then three months later, I finally decided to go back to the gym, you know. Okay. So you get your hand raised with Bradley Collins and they line you up with Ronald Jacobs <clears throat> for a rematch. You got that Highlander guy knocking on your door again. First round head kick, baby. <laughs> hey, Daddy. The state of Florida is not happy with Jason Knight. <clears throat> Rob Khan student, Tony Way, he's up next. He, he goes by the only Gracie Tampa, April 12, 2014. Why is Atlas Fights bringing all these guys in from Florida to fight you? Uh, there was a guy named Paul Dominici. And Paul okay, was old school cat. Yeah, he was the matchmaker for Atlas Fights, and he was in big with all these Florida guys. And I love Paul to death, but I think that he was challenging himself to find somebody to beat me. You know, I think that in his head, I thought that I think he was lining up these guys that he thought could beat me. And uh, I just I wasn't going, man. I didn't, I wasn't trying to let nobody beat me. Yeah, I was on I was on a path. Especially when I got out of the when I got out of prison, UFC was the only option, man. I, I think I was, I think I was twenty one, or I think I was twenty two. I was twenty two. I went up to Alan Belcher and I told him, "Say, hey, man, uh, next year I want to I want to be in the UFC." And he's like, "Oh, that's a good goal. You know, let's work towards it." Well, then, uh, like you said, I, I fight Ron Jacobs, head kick. Then Tony Way, I go out there and I beat him. It was the craziest, weirdest submission ever. I don't even really know what he tapped out to, but I caught him. I catch him in a reverse triangle. And his leg, I reach down, I grab his leg, and I, I've got him in the triangle, and I've got him pretty much in a knee bar at the same time. Cause I like I got a Boston crab with a triangle. Yeah, like I, I'm, on, I'm on his back. I'm on his back, like, same position as you would go for a rear naked choke. Right. But I'm in a triangle 
a triangle choke from his back and I reach down. He's still kind of standing at this time. I reach down, I grab his leg and I pull it up and it sets him down. And I just bring his, bring his leg up to his face like a knee bar. I'm not sure if he tapped from the choke or if he tapped from the knee bar. And I'm not even sure what they call that. They probably just called that on your paper. I guarantee you that it probably just says first round submission. It says inverted triangle. Inverted triangle. Okay. So, so, but you got to, so people at home that are listening to this, you got to take this in its proper context. Rob Conroy in jujitsu, the ju lore of jujitsu, which we've got a bunch of those guys on this podcast, you know, in our library. Rob Conroy, like you've got your your dirty dozen of the first 12 guys that got black belted by, by Hoist Gracie. If Rob Conroy isn't number 13, he's number 14 or 15. So he's somebody that is at this moment, at this time, very esteemed in that world and he's a feeder system to the ultimate fighter very few gyms have put as many people on the ultimate fighter than rob Kahn. tony way is one of his guys and you submitted him yeah like yeah, if you really look at that fight there's a lot of depth there that's that's what uh that's what some people don't realize about my career is yeah, you know, I made it to the UFC the hard way. Now I got nowadays you got guys that are getting in the UFC at like four and zero and six and zero and six and one and stuff like that. I was sixteen and one by the time I made it to the UFC, and never once did they send me a name and I'd be like, "No, nah, I don't want to fight that guy." If they sent me a name, I I tell them I don't care who it is. You know. If my coach is good with it, I'm good with it. Call my coach. If he's good, I'm good. And my coach, I told them, you know, don't even call me with the name. You know, you, I don't care who it is. You don't have to call You're wasting me. wasting time in the call. Yeah. <laughs> and and that's, how, that's how I've always been. You know, if you, if you think I can beat them, coach, I think I can beat them, coach. You know, that's the way I look at it. I – I don't care if they're number seven in the world, number two in the world. I fight them. If you, if you think we can make it happen, you tell me how we need to make it happen. I'll do my best to, to execute your game plan. All right. June 21st, 2014, you fight for V3 fights. Where is that lo event, where is that event located? That's in, uh, it's like, the, um, it's round trip. If the actual fight was in Memphis or if it was in uh Starkville, Mississippi. I think it was in Memphis. That was in Memphis, I believe. Is it your first airplane ride? No, no, we drove. It was like a, a six hour drive. We we drove. So is your first airplane ride in your life when you fought for the UFC or Titan? Titan. Titan. I flew to Portland, Oregon. So Titan is your first airplane ride. Okay, so Everybody at home, we always try to figure that out. When guys come from adversity, like Jason does, I mean, are, are you a trailer park guy or a house guy? Oh, yeah, man. I, uh, well, started out trailer park. Then once uh, once my stepdad came in the picture, lived in a house, and my dad Ooh. always was in trailer parks. So, yeah, I've been, I've been to plenty of trailer parks. Okay. So, for instance, we always try to figure out when their first plane ride was. And then how would it affect them? Because it's different. It cha it can yeah. kind of change. Either you think, man, I finally made it, or holy shit, now this is real. Okay. Uh, all right. So go back. All right. So we got who who would I fought Ronald Jacobs, kicked him in the face. Then I fought Tony Way, triangle. Inverted straight. triangle. And now Next you got fight. Harry Next Johnson. Fight. Harry Johnson. And that's his uh, real name, too. I thought it was like yeah. a fake name. That's his real name. Yeah. I, I get him with a Von Flew choke, and I believe it is second round. Okay. So he, he comes from – we had talked about the journeyman fighter with the crazy records that you got to be careful of. He's one of them. Oh, he's, yeah. He's 12 and 10, and he's on a six-fight win streak. So essentially you got a body, somebody that comes in, as a body that's gotten a whole bunch of upsets, and he's a lot better than his record is. And the promoter, do you know who the promoter is for this Ron Trip? 
I I can't remember the guy's name, but I did know the promoter pretty good. Um, man, he's got to win. He's the guy that beat uh, Hicks and Gracie in the Sambo match. Yeah, yeah. Ron Jacobs was tough, man. Um, I they brought me there to lose that fight. They thought that they were gonna put me on Harry guy. Johnson. You mean Harry Johnson? Yeah, yeah, Harry Johnson. I don't know why I'm saying Ron Jacobs. Harry Johnson. Yeah, they, they brought me there to lose that fight and. If you would have watched the first round, you would have thought I was going to lose that fight. You know, we, we were back and forth. He caught me with the biggest, most pretty flying knee ever. Caught me with a flying knee right on the chin, and I took it like a champ. I I caught him in a clinch, and I pulled guard and kind of, you know, recouped myself and just smiled about it. Like, man, he caught me. Well, then uh come out the second round, and – Wound up, I catch, I catch Devon Flu, and it's like, hell yeah. Next fight should be Thiago Moises for Atlas, right? Nope. Gilbert nope. Burgos. Gilbert Burgos. That is my second uh, go-go plata. Right. So, I, I, got a, I got a question for you. I mean, at this point, you got a great record. You know, like you said, you're coming up. You made, you, you've already put in the work. Uh, you got good instincts. I mean, you know, like you, you've been saying a little rough around the edge. He looks like a child. He looks like like he started fighting at 14. I couldn't even imagine what he looked like then, but at this moment I found some pictures. He looks like he's like 12 years old, but he's like 20. No, he's got yeah. and, and he's got life experience, you know, up to yin yang kind of things, but yeah, he went to prison already. Jeez. Yeah, but and and bounce back from that, you know. Yeah. Get himself to it. And this is what I mean. It's like what's missing here is some guidance, like a real like Alan Belcher's uh, active fighter. That's not a guy. You need a professor or a guy, and that's missing here. So he's got to kind of feel it out and always be the B side. But that's kind of. Did you ever look for? You know, like I'm going to American Top Team, or you know, any of that type of. Did that ever cross your mind? Man, I'm I'm probably one of the most loyal guys you'll ever meet. Um, I started training with Alan Belcher when I was 15, and the goal was I'm going to make it without any kind of manager, uh, any kind of outside help or anything like that. I wasn't going to other gyms. Yeah, I would cross train here and there, but um, man, I was I was working at the shipyard. Uh, when I made it to the UFC, I was working at Halter Marine, barely making any money, trying to take care of my daughter, you know, trying to take care of a family. And, um, wow. You know, going to other gyms really wasn't an option. You know, I couldn't afford it. My mama couldn't afford for me to go there. And, you know, I damn sure I, I what the sponsors I got, I would get those, you know, right before a fight. I never had anybody that wanted to, to pay full time or whatever. But um <clears throat> yeah, I would I would get a sponsor for two, three hundred bucks, get another few sponsors, and I would get them right before the fight and I would use that money. You know, I wouldn't I wasn't trying yeah. to spend it going to a gym. But um Yeah, it's for bills and food. Yeah. That's it, you know. But uh yeah we fight I fight Harry Johnson What's next after that? Thiago Moises? Nah, bro. Gilbert Burgos. 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 Six and two. Yeah. Wait, wait, hold up. Let me set this up now. Tony Wade doesn't go right. Guys from Tampa, they say, you know what, man? Fuck it. Send them Burgos. Burgos is a six and two. High end jujitsu player. Tough as shit. He's the same gym. So they know who you are. They got firsthand experience of what you look like. So another guy out of Gracie, Tampa. Walk us through it. All right. We go in there with Burgos. I throw a couple punches, not very many. He tries to take me down. Well, whenever he goes to try to take me down, this is the very first time I've ever been cut in a fight. The very first time. Um, I've been cut a few times in the gym, you know, head butts and stuff like that. But he goes to try to take me down. I go to sprawl. And whenever I go to sprawl, we headbutt. And he headbutts me right on the bridge of my nose. And it just starts gushing. 
Well, uh, I remember he lands on top of me, and I throw up rubber guard immediately. And the blood is, like, pouring out of my face so bad that I have to close my eyes, and I'm doing the rest of this stuff by feel. Because, like, literally I have puddles in my eye sockets of blood. And uh, I pull the leg over, sink the go-go plata in, and – it's done that quick. Like I, I'm, I think it was probably 30, 45 seconds into the first round, maybe a minute at the most. And I beat him by go, go Plata. And, uh, I just remember thinking how cool it was that my face was full of blood. Yeah. You know, I, it was, it was like this, this was my first time ever getting cut up. So I, I didn't even try to wipe the blood off. I no. took a hundred pictures with a blood soaked face, you know, <laughs> That's not supposed to be. All right, so Miguel, let me explain to the audience how committed Jason was to the sport of mixed martial arts. Right now, you've got angel wings tattooed on your back. Yeah. Prior to that, would you mind explaining to people what you may have had on there? All right. I, I don't, and how old you were when you got it? I know we got some Chuck Liddell fans around the world, right? So if you see Chuck Liddell... He has a tattoo on his arm. It says the pit. And you got Chuck Liddell going, ah, with the big ass Grim Reaper face and a hood. Well, I see this on a shirt. And I'm like, that is the coolest shit ever. I'm getting it as a tattoo. Well, I have I have my first tattoo across my back. I get it when I'm 14. It says night across my shoulders. Well, by the time I'm 15, I decide I want to get, you know, this Chuck Liddell, the pit, you know. Well, the guy draws it out on paper. And this is in this is in my dad's living room. You know, this is a a, a trailer park artist, if you will. <laughs> but, yeah, this is in my dad's living room in his trailer. <laughs> and he draws it out on this piece of paper, and it looks so good, man. It looks just like the, what was on the shirt. It looks so cool. Well, then he tattoos it on my back and I have this little bitty body about this big and then a head about this big. Looks like a big ass bobble head on my back. And uh, uh, puts a cage month, across it. Yeah, I was about to say a month or two later, I get somebody to put the cage on there. <laughs> and, again, we're in we're in the living room in the trailer, you know, and Instead of actually everything was clean, like you know, brand how, new needles, brand new link, <laughs> yeah, chain link, chain link fence, it interlocks. Yeah. Well, this lady goes on my back and just starts drawing X's. That's my chain link. So yeah, now I've just got some big ass black wings as a cover up. Uh, that still not finished, by the way. I just had to, I had to get something done to cover up that that nightmare that was on my back. And granted, when I was 15, this was the coolest thing in the world. You know, I'm I'm walking around school with this big ass back tat. And I'm the, <laughs> I'm the coolest 15 year old at school, you know, pulling up my shirt, showing everybody. But by the time I'm like 17, I'm hating life, wondering why in the hell did you do this, you know? But yeah, I got it. Great thing quick. <laughs> All right, so for people at home, we're probably not going to get to it, but when Jason was in the UFC, he used to talk a lot of shit while he was fighting, and he was a take one to give one guy. I mean, that's that's his fighting style. And when he would talk, it was very direct. He'd call people out, but his accent is a lot different than a lot of other parts of the country. And he got the fighting style of a Diaz brother, so they would call him Hick Diaz. Like instead of Nick Diaz, they'd be calling him Hick Diaz. And it's, in all honesty, the biggest compliment you could ever give somebody. Yeah, bro. Like the, people ask me, like, what do you, how do you feel about being called Hick Diaz? I'm like, hell yeah, I'm, they're comparing me to the Diaz brothers. What do you mean? Yeah. Hick and Nate are the best, bro. You know, you'll be, you're, you're from, you know, Southern United States. You know, it's just, it's really wild because I've been down to like your area a couple times and like, you know, I'm, I'm from Chicago, so I'm, I'm a Yankee. I'm a northerner. And it took me a while to kind of figure out. I'm like, you know what? 
they're looking at me like I'm rude because I talk real fast or, or real direct or hard with my words. And like, I look at them like they're, oh, they're just speaking slow. Maybe they're not as smart, but the reality of the situation is, is they're being polite. They're being polite and they're listening to you. And it's just, it's, man, I really enjoy the Southern United States, man. It's, it's just different. Yeah, for sure. And uh, one thing that's a little different around here, most people say, like, if, if you're going to say something, you add the G. We say something, you know, stuff like that. Like we, we shorten all of our words. And that's something I, that's that we've just done it our whole lives. I, I guess that's another little Southern thing. <laughs> and how, how was it adapting, leaving that area and dealing with like Northerners? I mean, it, it was awesome. Uh, my, my first, my first UFC fight, I went out there. I lost to Tatsuya Kawajiri. And then after that, I fight Jim Allers and I dominated. I dominated yeah. Jim Allers and uh, everybody. That was, I want to say that was in Chicago. That Dude, I, I was friggin' seven rows out, man. Hell yeah, it yeah. was in Chicago. Yeah, that was in Chicago. And uh, man, the crowd loved me. Everybody was cool afterwards. Dude. I, I walked around and, and drank Patron all night and and lived it, you know, lived it up. Chicago was by far my favorite place I've ever fought. I don't, I don't know why. It was something about Chicago it was awesome. Cool. But what, let me, let me just kind of re- rewind just a little bit. So, you beat Bam Bam with the Gogo Plata. You have a rematch with Michael Roberts, who's now, you know, who's he's, a, he's got about nine fights. You beat him with the decision. And then the American top team brings brings sends over. So at this point, the American top team, and we brought Diago Alves on. You can listen to that interview. What they were doing is, yeah, dude, we'll fly a couple of our guys up with corners. You don't have to pay for the hotel. Don't worry about a fight purse. Just make sure they're in your main event, though. So what they were doing is they were sending all these guys up, just murdering ticket sellers. And a greedy promoter would just think, oh, yeah, let me just have your guys, dude. It's not costing me anything. But meanwhile... They're, they're like ringers on a softball team. They're they're killing people. So the American top team sends up Tiago Moises. He's five and zero Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt, and he's actually a current UFC fighter right now. And you're not supposed to win this one for sure. You you were getting your ass beat. All right. All right. This is the first time I've ever fought scared. They tell me it's from American top team. And it never registers. It never registers that he's from American top team. You know, there's a million American top teams. And then we get to weigh-ins. I see the dude. It's like, oh, I'll beat him. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm bigger than he is. I'm taller than he is. And then they say, American top team, Coconut Creek, Florida. I look at my coach. I was like, he's from Coconut Creek, Florida. I'm like, man, that's that's the good American top team. It's like, <laughs> so, I was like, oh, shit. Well, man, something clicked. I threw the straightest punches. I I threw the best combos. I beat Thiago Moises every second of every round. I beat the dust out of Thiago Moises. And not saying I would do it now. I've seen him. I went up there to American Top Team and I trained, and he's huge. He's huge right now. He walks around probably 185. And – uh but man, I was I was so amped up. I, I went out there and I was nervous. I was scared. And did you think you fought better scared? Oh man, I fight so much better scared. I, so much better. It was weird. It was like you, you back you back a cat into a corner. What the hell's that cat gonna do? He's gonna come out of that corner. You know, you, you back somebody scared up, they're gonna fight their way out of that position. And that's what happened that night. I went out there and I made sure that I hit him before he hit me. <laughs> In every exchange, and uh, I, that was a decision, but I dominated. Miguel, we talked about Hick Diaz being a compliment. I'm going to give you guys an example. In 2018, you were in a bathroom in a bar, and you beat <laughs> up two dudes, and it went viral on the internet. Yes, sir. 
Um, <laughs> uh, I'll tell you the story about that. So I, I went out with a couple of friends. I, I had probably six of my friends there. And no guys, you know, we're not we're not females. We don't say, hey, I'm going to the bathroom, compete with me, you know. So I was they're all out on the dance floor or whatever. I d I didn't have probably two beers in me. And uh I go in the bathroom and I'm in the stall. Well the guy next to me, he's complaining about his wife for whatever reason. And I there was like twenty people in there, you know. I, I'm just thinking as a joke. I was just joking around. I was like, oh, yeah, his wife. You know, and then uh, the next thing you know, I'm steadily taking a leak, and I hear my stall door snatch open. So, you know, I finish, you know, finish my business. I turn around, and when I turn around, there's two guys standing at my stall door and, like, ten guys behind them, and three of them's holding up cell phones already recording. And the guy said, what would you say about his wife? I was like, hey, man, you might want to back up or you're finna go to sleep. And then his buddy's like, I bet you won't say that to his face. I said, you might want to back up, too. I said, you might want to back up or you can go to sleep, too. And then they went to rambling on, telling me what they're going to do to me. I just kind of I looked off. And bam, I stuck the biggest one as hard as I could. And I lit him with three or four more. And then he rushes me to the back of the stall. And I'm kind of like sitting on the top of the toilet and he, he's got he's got both my arms hemmed up for a few seconds then the little guy comes over the top of him pops me three or four times and then i finally get my right hand free i started working him too and then before it was over with they were both just reaching up trying to gouge my eyes out <laughs> so yeah it was it was a, a fun experience to relive you know yeah, you know, looking back at it, I, it pops up on my memories every now and then. So it's something funny to tell yeah. my kids about one day. Hey, dude, how, how does that night end though? Does somebody go to the, you know, does somebody go to jail, and or you just kind of shake hands and no. walk away? What's the finish on that? No, uh, the, the bouncers came in, they kicked us all out of the club, and I'm telling <laughs> all my buddies, you know, they're, they're like, "What happened? What happened?" I was like, "Man, you know, I, I kicked their asses. I I beat the hell out of both of them." And I got this this one little spot on my eye where I guess a fingernail or something got me. I got blood running down my face where I got scratched. And uh, when I'm telling my buddies that I whooped their ass, both these guys don't really got no marks on them. I'm sure they got knots all in the top of their head and stuff. And they're looking at them, they're looking at me, and they're like, oh, yeah, I'm sure you did. You know, yeah. <laughs> well, then the day, the next day, Brock Weaver – he messages me. He's like, hey, bro, I seen you on Snapchat last night beating the hell out of two dudes at the bar. I was like, oh, you did? Man, send me that video. He sends me the video, and I go to show it all my buddies. like, oh, you really did whoop them, didn't you? I'm like, yeah, I told you that I did. <laughs> <laughs> but you ever taught my word. Right. <laughs> yeah. All right. So you beat Thiago Moises. Huge victory. Current UFC vet. So Titan FC comes along. On September 19, 2014, you take your first airplane ride and you fight Masa, dude, one of Musa the first waves of the Russian invasion. Ma Masa was it Musa Kamenev? Musa Kamenev. Kamenev, go ahead. Yeah. I, uh, people think that the Artem fight was my toughest fight. You know, everybody, if you look at my my record you look at you know the way i've looked after fights you think artem no musa kamenaev was by far the toughest fight i've ever been in in my life this russian was so roided out it was unreal he had stairs he had cc after cc pumping through his veins right in the middle of that fight and uh i go out there first round and he's just beating me like a drum you know, uh, trying to stand up with him is not going too great. He's beating the hell out of standing up. And if one finger touched my leg, I was taken down. There was no defending his takedowns. He was so much stronger than me. And whenever we get to the ground, I start throwing up rubber guard, throwing up rubber guard. And I would think I would have something. He'd snatch out and he'd beat on me a few more times. I'd work my way back to my feet. 
he beat on me standing up, take me back down, beat on me some more on the ground, and then finally the, the bell rings. Round is over. What are they saying in the corner in between the first and second round? Oh, uh, Alan, the whole time, uh, every time I catch him in rubber guard, Alan's like, oh, you got it where you want him. You're going to you're gonna win this battle. Just keep doing what you're doing. You're going to win this battle. You're thinking that the rubber guard is the way to finish this fight. If he keeps taking you down, we're going to finish him here. We're going to finish him here. And all right, a little backstory before this fight, I had been sitting on the couch. I was doing nothing. I had been sitting around working, and Alan Belcher calls me up on two-week notice, asked me, do I want to take this fight? Oh. Well, here, was, let me set the table. This guy's 15 and 3. He's at a fight club, Bur uh, Burkat, Burkett. You know, like that leader over in Russia uh, that's like you're not supposed to hang around him, and he's got tons – he's like a warlord, tons of money. This is one of his guys. Yeah. Well, he calls me and he asks me, do I want to take the fight? <laughs> yes, of course. You know, he says, he says, you know, if you win this fight, you will be in the UFC after you beat this guy. And uh, I was like, hell yeah, of course I want to take the fight. And um, he said that uh, if you beat this guy, you know, you're going to get in the UFC or whatever. It's like, hell yeah. Well, I come off the couch. I have like, I think, nine days that I can actually train before the fight. And then we fly to Oregon and we're there for like four days before the fight. And, you know. Did the airplane freak you out? What now? Did the airplane freak you out? Oh, no, man. That was the most exciting thing ever. Yeah, you know, I was I was in the air, bro. I was looking down at ants running around and stuff. Yeah. You know, it, it was awesome. Uh, but yeah, we, we get there and everything. We're in the first round beats me like a drum. We go into the second round. And, uh, by this time I calm down a little bit, you know, I'm, I'm kind of doing a little bit better on the striking. I kick him a few times and I feel like I'm, I'm okay. You know, we're 30 seconds into the second round. Bam. He takes me down. I tie him up, you know, with my rubber guard again. He pulls out, punches me a few times. I tie him up again. I hold him for a second. The referee stands us up. He stands us up. We go back at it. I punch him a few more times. He takes me down again. Well, then I lock up the rubber guard, and there's a submission called the stocks. All right, the way you do this, you got the rubber guard locked up. Your, your leg is behind his – his neck all right you got one arm tied up between your leg and your arm and then you take your foot and you fish it under the other armpit when you fish that foot under the other armpit then you reach across you grab the hand and basically you have both arms tied up with your leg and your hand and they can't do nothing so this is what i'm going for finally i get the stocks and I start to try and stretch him out, and he's so strong. I've got this arm back behind his head like this, and he just pulls it down because he's so much stronger than me. He pulls it down, and whenever he does, I switch to an arm bar. And I got this arm bar, and I'm talking about the deepest arm bar ever. I'm hyperextended. It looks like it's about to break, and I'm trying with everything in me to break it. I'm ah, doing this, you know, giving everything I got. And somehow he rolls his arm and he slips out this arm bar. Well, whenever he slips out this arm bar, I got the triangle ready to come around. Slips out the arm bar, I sink in the triangle. And this was my last ditch effort. This remember, is it? This was it? Yeah. I remember at one point in this fight, you know, probably, probably 30 seconds or so into the second round. The first time he took me down in the second round, I remember I'm laying there and he's done been punching on me and I'm trying to tie him up. And I look over at my brother. My brother's in my corner and Alan Belcher's in my corner. And every time throughout my life that I fought in the cage and my brother's been in my corner, if I look at him and I'm in a bad spot, he starts screaming, get your ass up, figure something out. You got to do something. And it lights a fire in me. I figure out a way to get out of that position. I get up. I do whatever I got to do. 
because my brother just yelled at me and told me I got to do it. Well, when I look at him this time, I'm laying there and I look at him. He gives me this look. He's just like, like, man, I don't know what to tell you. You know, like you can <laughs> see it in his eyes, like you're fucked. Like in, in his face, I can see like you're fucked. And bro, like that killed me. It killed me. And then finally, whenever I catch this triangle, I squeeze with everything I had in my life. I just give it everything I had because I knew after that the gas tank was done. You know, I've done did I've done exhausted every effort. If he gets out this triangle, I'm just gonna die today. And I finished the triangle. Well, like I told you, he beat me like a drum for the whole first round. He beat me like a drum half the second round. And after this fight for a solid month. I couldn't duck. I couldn't turn over in bed without getting dizzy, feeling like I was going to pass out. I had the worst concussion ever. But uh, there we go. after the fight, I'm over there throwing up in the trash can, and Alan Belcher walks up to me and he says, guess who I just got off the phone with? I was like, who? He said, Sean Shelby. I was like, cool. Who's Sean Shelby? He's like, that's the <laughs> – He's like, that's the matchmaker for the UFC. That's that's the matchmaker for the 145 division. He said there was like, he said there was like 30 people in front of you. He said, now you just jumped in front of everybody. I was like, hell yeah, that's awesome. He said, uh, he said, I told Sean Shelby that you won the fight. He's like, he beat the Russian. He was like, yeah, he beat the Russian. He's like, no fucking way. He said, and then Sean Shelby went and watched it. He's like, oh, dude, we want him, and. You know, next thing you know, you know, that was my ticket to the UFC. We already knew that was my ticket. No, Go wait ahead. a minute. Wait a minute, dude. This is where it gets a little funky, man. And and I, I appreciate you've been – you haven't avoided a single question up to this point. You take – there's 12 months off, and you try out for the ultimate fighter, and you get turned down. Yeah. There's like 14 That's, months off. I apologize. There's 14 months off in between – Go ahead. Between Titan and the UFC, it was that long? Yes. They watch really? you. All right. So here's what here's what happens. I try out for the ultimate fighter. You know, uh, the, the opportunity comes up not long after Titan FC to try out for the ultimate fighter. And at this time, I'm still on probation. You know, I'm still on probation from the charges that I caught. <sighs> well, uh, whenever – they asked me, you know, do I want to try out for the Ultimate Fighter? My coach, Mike Sanford, uh, he was he was the one of the main ones pushing for it. And uh, I was like, man, they're awesome on it. I can't, you know, I can't leave the state. You know, they're not going to let me leave the state for that long to go over there. And because uh, I had I'd already had to get permission to fight for Titan and everything. And, uh, he was like, what if we paid your fines off? You know, do you think that would release you? Well, then I go up there and I talk to my probation officer and I was like, hey, you know, is there any way we can speed this along or you'll give me a hey, you got an opportunity. Yeah, you're, you're supposed to yeah, be better. This, I got I an like, opportunity to be better. Yeah. I was like, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. You know, my window is about this big. You know, I need to seize this opportunity. And she tells me, she's like, look, if you can get your fines paid off, I was like maybe $2,500 left. And uh, so if you can get your fines paid off, then I'll let you go. And so she said, I, I, will, I will go ahead and free. It was like two and a half years early she released me from probation. But uh, I tell my coach about that. And he was like, $2,500, we can make that happen. He's like, uh, let, let, I'm going to I'm gonna start you a GoFundMe. And that's what he did. He started me a GoFundMe. Man, in like three days, this GoFundMe, you know, he just announced that I was trying to get to the Ultimate Fighter, trying to get to this, and I had to do this. I had to pay off these fines, all this shit. Within like two days, I had like five grand. Went up there, and I paid off. Because I'm telling you, at this time, I was the shit in Mississippi. You know what I'm saying? I was – you, know, you, you got a guy that's turning his life around. He's got something in front of him. You know, he fucked up. Is what it is. Now he's doing good. Well, anyways, I take the money to her. She she releases me. I'm good. Go Shit, try. You must have felt like that. Must have been an incredible feeling. 
Oh, man, that was the shit. It was awesome. I, it was one of the best days ever. Well, I go try out for the Ultimate Fighter. It starts out like this. You go in there. I think it's like 30 seconds or a minute or something like that. I know. I'm sorry. It's like two minutes. You do a two-minute jujitsu match. You know, you got 20 – say there's 20 guys in here. They line you up with one of them. You got two minutes to prove yourself in jujitsu. Well, the guy, we start rolling. Ten seconds in, I tap him with a go-go platter. Well, then after that, you know, I, I think I tapped him again with the arm bar within the two minutes, and then we just rolled it out the rest of the time. All right, so that is, that's tryout number one. I make it through the first round of tryouts. Second round of tryouts, you hit pads. You know, I'm trying out for the 155, you know, season, right? You go in there, I hit pads, do good with that, make it to the third round of tryouts. The third round of tryouts, you go sit in a room with, you know, two guys, and they ask you a bunch of questions about your career. And they're like, oh, man, yeah, I see you got a very impressive record. You're 16 and 1. Um, how many times you fought at 155? I was like, uh, I think like once. You said, who, me? <laughs> yeah, that, like, I, I was like, I think like once, you know, and, and, and that was a catch weight because the guy couldn't make weight or whatever. And uh, he was like, well, why are you trying out for the 155 season? I was like, man, I was thinking it'd be better. I mean, you know, I don't have to cut any weight. You know, I, I walk around pretty close to my weight. I don't have to cut weight. I don't have to feel bad, you know, on fight day or whatever. I saw all these other guys are going to be cutting weight. I'm going to be faster. I'm going to be in better shape. Smart. I, said, I, I can spend all my time, you know, focusing on everything. Training. Yeah. Focusing on weight. Well, long story short, they come out, they call out the names. I'm not on the name. So, well, fuck, yeah, that sucks. Well, around this time, I'm about to – I've already had my second kid at this time. I've already had my second little girl. And around this time, I'm with my second baby mama, and we're about to have my little boy. And, uh, you know, at this time, I'm focusing on, you know, trying to raise my family, trying to work – I'm working at the shipyard and might be making – I think I might have made seven hundred dollars a week or something like that, six seven hundred dollars a week, and uh, just just enough to get by, you know. So I wasn't that focused on the gym at that time. I'm fixing to have a little boy. I'm trying to get ready for this little boy, you know. I'm trying to make sure that everything's ready to go. Well, the day that my son is born, November twenty fourth. My son was born, and Alan Belcher calls me not even an hour after he's born and is like, hey, man, what's up? It was either it was either right after he was born or right before he was born. Like, hey, man, what's up? Uh, you want to fight in the UFC in 13 days? <laughs> I haven't been in the gym in six months, but hell yeah, I want to fight. Now, it, it hadn't been six months, but. Right. I haven't been playing it forever. Wait, let me set this up. I guess this is this is phenomenal. This is phenomenal. So, UFC, it's at the Tough 22 finale, the season he was supposed to be on it. They said no. It's December 11, 2015. They throw him up against shoot, former Shudo world champion Kawajiri. Now, it's 13 days notice. And think about this. How many no's did do you think that they may have gotten before they finally got to you? Oh, no telling, man. That a he was shitload a, because he's 34, 8, and 2. That's why. He's number, he number 13 in the world, right? Okay, so yeah. I leave from the hospital, and I'm in line at um Raising Cane's. Raising Cane's Chicken Tenders. I'm, I'm going over there to get some chicken tenders. For me and my old lady at the time. And I'm about to order at the drive thru, and Alan Belcher calls me. He's like, Hey, you want to fight in the UFC in 13 days? I'm like, Hell yeah. He was like, Look, this guy's really tough, but I think you can beat him. I was like, Okay, who is it? He said, Tatsuya Kawajiri. I'm like, Okay, who's that? 
You know, because like I don't, I don't follow fighting. I'm a fighter, but the rest of those guys, I don't really give a damn about. You know, I followed it until I got into it. You know, I, it was cool to me until I was 17 or 18. But now, if I don't know your name, I'm probably not watching for you to fight. I'm probably never gonna know your name unless somebody's like, "Hey, man, you gotta watch this guy." Right. But uh, anyways. He's like, it's tight to your cow, Jerry. He's like, who's that? He's like, uh, he's number 13 in the world. But, man, I think you can beat him. He's like, he's number 13 in the world, but, man, I think you can beat him. I was like, hell, yeah, let's beat him. You know, and uh, I was like, I'll be at the gym tomorrow. And I go back to the hospital, and I was like, look, baby, uh, I kind of got good news, but I kind of got bad news. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, what's that? I was like, good news is I'm fighting in the UFC in 13 days. Uh, bad news is you're not going to you're not going to see me for the next couple of weeks. Like I'm going <laughs> to the gym tomorrow, and uh, so I trained. I think I trained a total of eight days for that fight. And uh, how mad was she? How mad was she at that time? She was cool with it, man. Like, surprisingly, she was like, "Hell yeah, you're fighting in the UFC." She's like, "That's that's that's cool." That's cool. Wow, let me. Hear. She thought it was cool until she saw the check. And then she you know it wasn't that cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, see, the, the first fight, well, no, no, that's that's the thing. 12,000 and 12,000 was my first UFC fight, right? If I won, I got 24. If I lost, I got 12. Either way, that's the most money I've ever seen at one time in my life. Wow. $12,000. The most money I've ever seen at one time in my life. Beat that five thousand. Yeah, GoFundMe. yeah. Before the UFC, you know, I was making probably, I think it was fifteen and fifteen is the most that I got fifteen hundred and fifteen hundred. So I might make three thousand if I want to fight. Uh no, I, I lied. The Titan FC was twenty five hundred and twenty five hundred. So I made five thousand. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh. I go into this fight with Tatsuya Kawajiri. I've trained about nine days, and then I go up there. I think it's four days before the fight. I got to be there. Well, wait, one question. Did Alan Belcher send guys, call Eddie Bravo, and have some of his his 10th Planet guys come and train with you to help you out for this? Yeah, he had he had several people come down to help me out. Um, don't get That's me wrong. He's a good dude, man. Oh, Belcher's good at who? Alan's a damn good dude. He, he's, he's brought a lot of guys down throughout the years. Him and my coach, Mike Sanford, they, they've forked out their own money plenty of times to get guys to come down and work with me. Uh, but yeah, we go, we go into this fight. Like I said, I trained nine days out of the whole 13. Top and your medicals. <laughs> What's up? Your medicals, too. You got to get your medicals in. Yeah. Oh, yeah, all that. I got to get all that shit done in those nine days. I go out there, and I throw a couple punches. He tries to take me down. He gets me down. I throw up a triangle, like, in the middle of it. I got him locked in a reverse triangle, and I'm elbowing his brains out. I elbowed him four or five times, and the triangle's locked up reverse, so I can't choke him out this way. But I can't elbow his brains out. And for some ungodly reason, Alan Belcher yells, switch it. I might switch it to be able to finish it. I should have stayed there and kept elbowing Tatsuya Kawajiri, and I would have won that fight. There's no reason why I couldn't have won that fight, because I had the reverse triangle locked up. He was going nowhere. I tried to switch it to be able to finish it, and he pulls out. He pulls out of the triangle. And then from then on, it just kept taking me down and kept wrestling the hell out of me. And uh, after that. Well, here, for context, for context, this guy's nickname. Well, first, everybody knows we do a lot of Pancrase stuff. We do a lot of Shudo stuff. So he's a 34-8-2 Japan fighter, which means he is crazy good. And his nickname is The Crusher, and he's known for his, like, unhuman strength. Oh, yeah. He was super strong. And, uh, yeah, uh, I I say that, but 
the Russian was way stronger. Tatsuya Kawaji, I mean, uh, Musa Kamanaya. But at the same time, Musa Kamanaya had worms running through his chest, how big his veins were. You know, like he was, he was pumped, slam full of some testosterone. I can tell you that. But, um, <laughs> Kawajiri. Yeah, after, after Kawajiri. Well, Kawajiri got- gave you that cut under your eye that opened yeah, but- up. Every fight after this. That's it. That was the that was the second time I was ever cut in my career was by Tatsuya Kawajiri. It never closed. Nope. It's yep, every fight after that. But yeah, it was it was an elbow and it went deep all the way to the bone. It was a deep ass elbow. And uh after that, man, I I won four straight in a row. I was what? dominating. So, Kyle Jerry, what is it? It's a phenomenal fight. What does the UFC brass say after that? What's the comp? I mean, you took it on a few days' notice. Nobody wanted it. You had a hell of a showing. What's the conversation like backstage? I don't really remember, man. Honestly, I didn't. I didn't get a whole lot of recognition out of that. You know, they they appreciated it, but you know, they they didn't appreciate it enough to get throw me no extra money or anything like that. But. uh I, I really didn't hear a whole lot about it after that. Um, but my my next fight, they did make sure that I, I got a good training camp for that. You know, they didn't call me so on the court. Jim Antler's fight that you already talked about. And <clears throat> was there something personal between you two? It, it was for me just, just because I went through and – I watched an interview of his, somebody like a podcast like this. Somebody asked him, you know, what was his game plan for this fight? And he was talking about, you know, he's seen my ground game. It's nothing special. You know, all I've got is the rubber guard. He's going to do what got him to the UFC. He's going to take me down. He's going to beat me on the ground. And in my eyes, Jim Allers couldn't beat me on the ground at that time. You know, in my head, like, hell no, nah, he ain't going to beat me on the ground. But just for him saying that, I ain't going to let him take me down. I'm going to beat his ass standing up. And that's what I did. I I beat his ass standing up. So you were talking tons of trash during the fight. This is actually the fight where the nickname Hick Diaz uh, was born. Joe Rogan was an instant fan. He's interviewing afterward. Um, Chicago, I, I remember being seven throw for this fight, and I was just like, I, you won the entire stadium that, that, that night. You won everybody over. Yeah, man, uh, that, that right there, that's your first big win, you know, your first real win. I remember, I remember rewind a tiny bit to Titan FC. I remember before Titan FC fighting was just fighting. You know, it wasn't serious. It was fun. It was just I was just fighting because that's what I love to do. And then Titan FC, I thought, you know, this is just another fight. You know, it wasn't that big of a deal until they called my name. They called my name. I opened that curtain. And when I opened that curtain, this big gigantic ass camera's in my face, three foot from me with a bright ass light. And I'm like, oh, shit. Like, my soul left my body. Like, oh, my God, this is real. You know, this is big time. And I'm glad. I'm so glad that happened in Titan. Because if that would have happened in the UFC, if that would have been my first time that they put that big-ass camera and that bright-ass light in my face. Your first airplane trip? Yep, all of it. Yep. Yeah. After that, you know, from then on, the camera was okay. I was used to that. It was. It didn't bother me. But that first time in Titan, man, I'm telling you, like it, it scared me to death. Like, oh my god, this ain't just another fight. This is big time. I got to do something here. And yeah, I don't know. It was. It was weird. But yeah. Um, wow. Wow. Well, now the, the Jim Allers fight. Actually, you mentioned. You know, you had a great fight with Kawajiri, but. It wasn't good enough for them to throw you any extra money. I think for Jim Allers, you could you did win the bonus. How how'd that feel? How'd that come about? Yeah, dude. Yeah. Heavy check. 
Yeah, that was my first $50,000 bonus. And I believe we were the first people to ever get a $50,000 bonus on a fight pass card. We were the fight pass. We were on the fight pass portion of the card. And we had everybody talking about us. Yeah, it, was, it was nuts. It, it was here, let, me, let, me, let me kind of make this come full circles, Miguel. Jim Allers, black belt, another Florida guy. A high-end Florida guy that kind of ran in the same circles as the people on his background. So it was just like you, you had that state's number. It was just wild, man. Yeah, man. Um, <clears throat> I, the, I just – I don't know, man. I, I just – anybody that they put in front of me, I didn't care where they was from or any of that. I, I probably didn't even know that Jim Allers was from Florida until after, you know, a while later. Uh, High-end like, black belt. Yeah, like I said, you know, if my, if my coach approved it, you didn't even have to tell me the guy's name. You just have to tell me we're fighting, tell me what date it is, what day we're getting on the plane, you know. I, we're we're, we're going to wrap up with one more, if you don't mind. We we're over two hours and greatly appreciate your time. Um, this guy from the sticks of Mississippi, from a place where he's not supposed to be anybody, ends up in Australia, November 26, 2016. So this isn't just like a little bit of a flight. This is a huge one. He's fighting Dan Hooker. There's 31 combined wins with 26 finishes between these two. Think right. about that. All right. So uh, before the Dan Hooker fight, uh, Eric Uresk, he trains at uh, Phuket Top Team. He comes down a month or two before that and tells me, you know, come out. To, to Thailand sometime. Come out and see us in Thailand. And whenever this fight gets booked, Mikey's like, hey, man, you should go to Thailand your last couple weeks of training. It'll get you acclimated to being on your, that side of the earth, and you'll get in some great-ass training. And we talked to Eric Uresk and Boyd Clark is the owner of Phuket Top Team. We talked to them. They tell me, hell yeah, you can come. You know, don't have to pay us a dime. And the dudes i was like hell yeah you know and uh i go out there i train with eric and man the best training i've ever got in my life probably some of the best experiences that i've ever got in my life and then uh we fly to australia but well, how was thailand what's up how, how did you like thailand i love thailand if, if I, i've told a million people this if i didn't have kids even if I did have, you know, my mom and all that still, if I did not have kids, I would probably I would probably be living in Thailand right now. You know, you hop on a moped, you drive five minutes, you're at the most beautiful beach you've ever seen in your life. You drive five minutes in the other direction, you're you're driving up a mountain petting monkeys and riding elephants. Drive another fifteen minutes in this direction and you're at another awesome beach that you'll see on a postcard. And the best part about it is everything is dirt cheap. I think an American dollar is like 22 tie bots, you know, so like one of our dollars is like 22 of theirs. So I, I went over there with like two grand and lived like a king for like two weeks. Yeah, you know, I got to do anything I wanted to do and still had money in my pocket when I was done. Wow. And, and for uh, those I, keeping I, track, it, just, just for those keeping track at home, the plane flight is long enough you can get drunk twice. Oh yeah. It's like it was like twenty four hours. I think it was like twenty two to Thailand and then uh it was like another six or eight hours or something from there to Australia for me. So from where you grew up to this day, you might be the only person I've ever visited that country of Thailand. Oh, 100%. Yeah, I, I mean, th there's been some guys and stuff that, that's been in the military and stuff that's been around the world from around here, but just the right. uh, regular Joes, hell yeah, man. I've done I've done outdid everybody. That's good. That's good. So let's take us through Hooker. You go to Australia. It's Hooker's backyard. We're talking about a guy that's fought in world title fights, a world title contender. Um, you're a super underdog. Okay, 
So Dan Hooker's from Auckland, New Zealand. And uh, in Melbourne, Australia, Dan Hooker has done fought like seven times and hasn't lost any. You know, so he is the guy there. You know, he he's the big dog. Well, as I'm walking out, everybody in the crowd, the whole arena is booing me. This is the very first time in my life that this has ever happened. You've never I been walked, booed in an arena? I've never been booed in an arena ever until Dan Hooker and still have never been booed since. <laughs> I go to walking out and the whole arena is boo. I'm talking about if there was 10,000 people in there, 9,998 of them was booing, and the only two that wasn't was with me. You know? So, even the vendors, time. the people selling hot dogs were booing. Telling you, everybody there was booing me. <laughs> and on the way down, on the way down to the cage, I'm just flipping them the bird. I get, in, <laughs> I spin around flipping them the bird. And, uh, anyway, <laughs> we, go out there, we go out there, and, uh, Dan Hooker's talking about before the fight that you know i'm i'm not gonna hit him this is not a a, a battle we're not gonna brawl it out this is a hit and not get hit so he was under my skin he had me pissed off you know i thought he was underestimating me i go out there and i'm talking about like a few seconds into the first round one of the first punches i hit him with i dropped him. wait at this point the amount of maturity you showed from not jumping on him and if you look at it from his point of view this guy's got to be on an airplane for like 24 hours before he gets here. It's a huge advantage. Oh, yeah. The, the, I don't even know if they knew I was in Thailand, though. They probably so, did. Yeah, and then uh, – but, yeah, I drop him, you know, a few seconds into the fight. And uh, if, I, if I remember correctly – the first round was kind of back and forth, and I, I still believe I won the first. Second round, no, for, first, I think that he might have got the first at the end of it. Either way, but I think I still won it because I got the knockdown. Anyways, first round is done. Go out second round, I take him down pretty quick into the second round, and I'm fighting for a rear naked choke the whole second round. And then we come out third round, I shoot for a takedown, and he's on to me. You know, he, he's stopping my takedown. I was like, well, shit, I can't take him down. And I knew he had better stand-up than me. I knew that he could beat me standing up because whenever we were kind of like point fighting, he was going to out-punch me. He was going to out-point fight me. So I just – I had to unleash the dog, man. I had to I had to dig deep and, and turn it into a brawl. And I just – I stayed in his face, stayed in his ass, and I beat him standing up the third round. And I got a unanimous decision in pretty much his backyard. Well, as soon as the fight's over, I hear boo. And I'm on the mic. I'm like, hey, 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 just give me, give me two seconds. Just let me talk for just one second. And everybody kind of quiets down. And I was like, look, I didn't come over here to beat y'all's guy. That's not what I signed up for. I came over here to beat the guy in front of me, and they just happened to put him in front of me. I, I fought as hard as I could. I got the win, and I hope I got some fan. I gained some fans tonight. Uh, I appreciate y'all. Blah blah blah, all that good shit. Well, then after the fight, we go out, and one guy comes up to me and he's like, "Hey, man," he said, "I just wanted to shake your hand." He said, uh, "I want to apologize. I was one of the guys that were booing, that was out there booing you." He said, "But man, you made a fucking fan tonight, and you know he's in a different." a different accent or whatever. He's like, you made a fucking fan tonight. I'm, I really appreciate what you said on the mic after the fight. I was like, hell yeah, I appreciate that. That's cool. Yeah, this, Miguel, the shocking thing for me is you're watching this kid from the sticks because that's where Jason is. He's from, you know, he's from a small area. He's in a stadium full of people and he took control of the situation. Like, a person that can do something like that, you got to have an immense amount of confidence. You just fought, like Chris Lytle does these with us. And he said, he says the worst interviews he ever gives are his post fight interviews because he's so high on adrenaline. He's like, I can't even, I don't even know what I said. You're in full control of your faculties, you're in the moment. And that's kind of like when I knew 
you were a special fighter because you were in the moment. Hell yeah, man. Uh, my favorite part about that fight was after the fight, I go to get on the bus. And John Anik, this is, this is the night I get the name Mississippi Mean. John Anik, I got to get on the bus. And he's like, Mississippi Mean, Jason Knight. What's up, brother? Shakes my hand and shit. I'm like, hell yeah, you know, I like that. And then, uh, you know, next thing you know, he just, I go out there and I beat Alex Caceres. And he's like, Mississippi Mean does it again. Jason Knight gets his hand raised. And next thing you know, I'm getting Mississippi Mean T-shirts and shit made. I'm like, man, I like Mississippi <laughs> Mean oh, is pretty badass. I think the cool thing with Caceres is, once again, Jason, you, you don't let the moment be bigger than you. And, and uh, very few athletes on in any sport have that ability. And it was one year to the day that your father died. And, you know, you had a prayer dedicated to your father, maintain your emotions. And Alex Caceres, dude, he was crazy stand-up guy. You know, easier fight for you was to go to the ground, and you kept it on your feet. You beat him at his own game. Yeah, man, I, I kept it on the feet for a good bit of I wound up beating him by a rear neck and choke. But, yeah, uh, I knew <laughs> with Alex Caceres, the thing about him, he likes to be at range. He likes to stay back and throw these crazy kicks and stuff. So I knew I had to bring the fight to him. I had to had to be a dog in that fight, and it, it worked out to my advantage. You call out Korean Superboy, it doesn't work out. They don't they don't put it together. But Chaz Kelly, Chaz Kelly is your next opponent. He's 18 and 2 and it's never been finished. And he's uh he's a Henry Hooft guy. Like that's like you you you're taking the the Florida All-Star team. The uh the Musa Kamanaya, he was a Henry Hoof guy. Henry Hoof, that was the first time I ever met Henry Hoof was when I fought Musa Kamanaya. Dude, you finish a guy in the third round, that's eight, like a stud 18 and two. <sighs> Come on, bro. The thing about Chad Skelly, bro, I broke his arm in the first round. Um, we were on the ground. I locked in a triangle. He goes to pull out the triangle. I suck in an arm bar for a split second, just a split second, and his arm popped and grinded. And then I we're back on the ground, and I lock in – a Kimura that it was not, it was nowhere near in the right position to finish this Kimura, but I just twisted it. And whenever I twisted it, it was like, it was like sandpaper grinding in his arm. Like you could feel it. Like it was like, his arm was just like rubber with sandpaper in there. It was, it was weird. And uh, he fought for another two rounds with that arm broke. Like you, you'd see it every now and then it starts sagging. He'd reach over with his other hand, kind of lift it back up and keep on trucking. And, you know, it, it, it took all the way to the third round to finish him just like that. That was one, one of the last, I've ever met. Phenomenal. Phenomenal for us. One last question. We're going to let you go. The rumor up here, you know, I'm from the north, obviously, and you're in all these wars, these really hard fights, but the rumor up here was that you weren't getting your rest in between fights. You and Brandon Davis, one of your teammates who's currently in the UFC, were having sparring sessions that were pay-per-view worthy. And you were leaving a lot in the gym and not saving it for, you know, the the TV. Is there any truth to that? No, I mean, we had plenty of wars in the gym. Uh, Brandon Davis, uh, a buddy named Tyler Hill, but that is nowhere near the reason why I, I'm I'm not in the UFC anymore. The reason I'm not in the UFC anymore, I went from making probably barely over twenty thousand dollars a year to you're dropping a hundred thousand in my lap. You're dropping seventy six thousand in my lap. You're dropping, you know, I got three fifty thousand dollar bonuses within like a year's period, and all this money told me I was rich you know I I thought that money was never going to end so I started partying I started you know buying every junk full weather in the world I started having entirely too much fun and not putting in the work that I should have you know I, I would still be in the gym 
But instead of focusing on that, I was focusing on other stuff at the same time. And out of the four fights that I lost, I feel like I won two of those. I agree with that. But, um, you know, I, I wasn't I, – I was just uh, – I was still young and dumb, man. I, I made those mistakes. I was 23 when I got all this money dropped in my lap and went buck-ass wild, had a lot of fun. I don't really regret none of it. I just – I wish that you – know, I wish that uh, – I wish I would have bought some land. Um, that's the only thing I regret is not buying some land and building my dream home. You know, I bought a house, I bought plenty of cars and toys and stuff like that, but I didn't, uh, I didn't buy the land and build the dream home. And that's, that's all I've got left to do with this career. You know, I've, We're here. I've we've, got, we've gone through your career and it's an insane journey, obviously. How old are you right now? I'm 30. Okay. So you're about four, three, four years away from your peak. What are your plans? Because every once in a while, I know you kind of jump back in there and not. Yeah. Um. So my my plan was to last year to to make a run for the UFC, try to get back to the UFC, and uh, I fought I fought two or three times MMA, and I just got signed to Eagle FC to uh, Khabib's little promotion. And they were going to pay me 10000 and 10000 for my first fight. And it goes up in $2,000 increments from there. I was supposed to be fighting for them this past May, this, this May. And getting ready for that fight, I tore my ACL in my left knee. Oh. Well, uh, I go to this knee surgeon. He tells me you know, I need to get an MRI. Get the MRI. They send the MRI to him. And he's in Hawaii whenever the MRI comes in. So he has one guy look at the MRI. And the first guy says it's a partial torn AC, partially torn ACL with a little bit of mis- meniscus damage. And he's like, oh, I don't like that. I, I don't like what he says. We're going to get another guy to look at it. Well, then supposedly the next guy looks at it, and it's a completely torn ACL with a medial meniscus tear. we got to have surgery. Oh, if you, if you want to keep fighting, we're going to have to have surgery. And, man, I this was three or four months ago, or May. Oh, shit, about five months ago now. I can run, I can jump, I can play basketball. You know, I was, I was down for about a month and a half, two months, you know, with all the information and stuff, and it was, it was feeling unstable. But now I can run, I can jump, I can play baseball out in the yard with my kid. I'm not having surgery. You know, I, the way I look at it is I'm going to get through Christmas, you know, ride this out till Christmas is over, let myself just keep on healing up, and then next year I'm going back to fighting. Whether it's MMA, bare knuckle, I'm fighting somewhere. And then, like I was saying, the only thing I have left to do in this lifetime, the only dream I have left to live, is buying me a bunch of land and building me a nice ass house, building me my dream home. Miguel, you paid your dues, brother. You fucking paid your dues for sure. Miguel, Miguel, right here. I'm gonna, ladies and gentlemen at home, if you're a TV producer, a Bryce Mitchell, Jason Knight hunting and camping type show is gold. Someone's got to do it. Someone has to do it, man. <laughs> I, I wouldn't. I would not be opposed to it for them. <laughs> well, good. Yeah, I'm. Uh, like I said, I, I've lived every dream I want to live. <laughs> buy the land, build the house, and the goal is by the time I'm 35, be able to retire if that's what I choose to do. And I can't retire until I build my damn house and buy my land. You know, that's that's my goal in my in my head is buy my land, build my house, and be done. But at the time when I'm 35, like they say, that's my prime. If I still feel like, you know, I've got some gas in the tank and I'm still hungry, then that's what I'm going to do. But, you know, I'm already at the point to where it's not live or die fighting anymore, you know. I know that, like, I have – I can build houses. I can weld. I can do anything that I need to do to survive – 
So I know that fighting's not my only course of making shit happen. So if if I haven't bought this house, built this land by the time I'm 35, then I'm probably done, and I'm gonna you know seek other means to make it happen. But Where are you gonna I, work out at? What gym? Uh, American Top Team in Diaberville, Mississippi. It's still Alan. It's still right there with Alan Belcher. Alan Belcher. He sold the gym to my coach Mike Sanford and a guy named Donnie Socher. They bought the gym. They turned it into American Top Team Diaberville, but it's still right there with the same people I've been with since I was 15. Miguel, and, how can you not be a fan of this guy? He gave me Jesus. Awesome. Jason. Awesome. I just wish I wish he had, had a mentor early. Yeah. That you know how you, he's got great instincts because half the half of the people would have been derailed somewhere along the line. Oh, yeah. And, and he never got derailed, made good decisions afterwards. Somebody who helped him avoid a couple of decisions, who helped him maybe negotiate a little better and things like that, you'd have a different story. But the story we got is fantastic, and you have nothing to be ashamed of, brother. No, no. And, and the biggest favor that ever really happened to you is your father leading by example. He It helped you more than, than it hurt you. It really did, bro. I, honest to God, man, I think the, the best thing that ever happened to me in my life besides my children is the fact that I went to prison. You know, if I wouldn't, you know, I was wild. I had a lot of fun and stuff, did stupid shit. But I'm going to tell you now, whenever I got sentenced to go to prison, I knew that I was missing, you know, all these firsts with my daughter. And I was in there maybe a week, and I knew that this is not ever a place that I'm coming back to. Consequences. All that's, a young man, that's a young man really making a fucking smart decision early, man, because – Oh, you know, you can. How many guys have thought that and then not followed through on? You know, I, all the all the dumb shit that I was doing before I went to prison, I haven't done it since. Like I, I took Xanaxes when I was seventeen. I caught that charge. I have not took a Xanax one day since, and I'm thirty now. You know, so I I learned from my mistakes. I learned the hard way. Don't get me wrong. I learned from all my mistakes the hard way. I've had a million people tell me don't do this, don't do that, and I had to figure it out on my own. But I learned them. I learned from them damn mistakes. It's consequences. You learn from consequences. That's you know, it. You're, and it's you're it. right, Jason. That's dude, right. you are the friggin' man. I've met you three times. All three times I've asked you for a picture. If I meet you fifty more times, I'll probably have fifty more pictures with you, brother. I'm a fan. Hell yeah, man! I appreciate y'all. Uh, anytime y'all want me to go on this podcast, I'm down. Uh, I really enjoy it. Dude, most people, same basic generic questions. Y'all switched it up big time. I loved it. Thank y'all so much for having me. I'll be texting you this in a couple birthday. weeks when we air it. Thanks, Chase. Appreciate it, buddy. Well, Mike, we got another one. Jason Knight is in the books. How can you not be a fan of that guy? You know, I, I think... You know, if people remember the bare knuckle fight, we're going to be in good shape because that's an all-time fight, you know, especially with, with the history being written nowadays. However, his MMA career, I don't know that he's got a huge name recognition. This was my first real ability to talk to him and get to know him real well. And, you know, I I, I don't know. I don't know how you could not like the guy. I mean, you know what I mean? If he. I don't think he had any friends in the MMA world. I think everything he did, he kind of figured out his own way. Alan Belcher, kind of like a guy whose path he followed. But, you know, another active fighter, especially on a high level, not a great manager. To, you know what I mean? It's like no disrespect to Alan, but I don't no, think no. this guy could have really taken care of him. Okay. So in this podcast, we kind of give you guys little bits of wisdom from the administrative side. And the one thing that, people have probably taken away if they've listened to a bunch of our interviews is there's nothing worse than a brave manager. And when you've got an active fighter at the highest levels of the sport, as, as somebody that's guiding you, that's a brave manager. Like that's the easiest way to have a 500 record and be one of the toughest guys in the sport. And um, no, man, I, I really, really enjoy like Jason Knight. It's, he's just, 
If you watch, there's two fights that you guys are, are must watch. You got to watch, obviously, his bare knuckle fight, his first one against Artem Lobov, and his second one against Jim Allers. So Jim Allers going into the fight, obviously, we kind of rehashed it, was talking a lot of smack. During the fight, you hear, oh, you think you get me down to the ground? Boy, crack, crack. Come on, I'll let you submit me. Get me down. Crack, crack. He's just doing the whole boy, boy. It's like he's rounding up some sort of farm animals, you know, like you would do like on the weekend. And man, I walked away from that just a, a huge, just like, he's not lying. Like you can't fake that. Like he's 145, you've got obviously him. At, at 170, you got near, you know, and, and the Diaz. It's like, we can have like an all Diaz team from about 125 all the way up to heavyweight, but they, there's certain boxes they have to check and. You know, cer certainly uh, Jason Knight does that with me. Yeah, I, I think this is actually my personal, one of my, probably my favorite interview of the entire year. What's your so far? Oh, I don't know. You're putting me on a spot. Jay, he's up there in that, like I said, I didn't know much about him before, and now I'm a fan. And, you know, just, I like to look at, you know, the reality of things. And the reality is he, he didn't have a mentor or a, a fan. He made a mistake early, but he wound up, you know, on the wrong side of popping pills and being, you know, in jail and stuff like that. Did nine months. If my main brain doesn't fail me here, yeah. Yeah. A good, good period of time, do some reflecting, and he did because he never, he never took Xanax again. He never wound up in jail again. He stayed focused on his career. Right now, his only regret is that I bought land and the dream house kind of thing. But he's taking care of himself pretty good for a guy who's been on his own. And the other part of it is, is He's still 30 years old. He's been through wars. So I don't know really what he has left, but if somebody on the talent side had recognized what well, the, the, the details he gave about picking up the rubber guard, I mean, he basically picked it up secondhand from a guy who did a weekend seven and he started working from there and using it effectively in fights. The stocks. You could, yeah. You, you could show hundreds of good athletes those moves in a weekend and they would not be able to master them enough to be able to use them in a fight, even if Their they went home to practice yeah. them. So this guy had a little bit of that raw physical talent that you look for that I think also is overlooked here because, you know, you got the Mississippi mean, the, the Hick Diaz, the, the, the attitude and stuff. It's easy to go down that path, but I think, I think you got a guy who's pretty sophisticated on the back end, you know, for, you know, it was rough around the edges, but inside, people, I think we missed out. Yeah, well, here, let, let's just say you're the UFC matchmaker here. Leonard Garcia, Nam fan. Can you imagine what type of wars and ratings you could have got with just throwing Jason Knight in that mix? I mean, Korean zombie? Yeah. You could have had, like, a, a bra for it all, you know, over a few periods and – yeah, you, know, you want to talk about a BMF belt? You know the winner of that tournament certainly deserves it. But here, here, back to my original question: Who is your favorite interview for the year so far? Oh, if 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 uh, you put me on a spot, but if I had it off the top of my head, I think the one I've gone back to and listened to the most, and a guy whose personality I didn't know before that I was basically meeting him in the interview, and I just liked. Enjoyed it the whole time with Jason Delucia. Delucia's fantastic. But we're coming on strong at the end of the year. Jamie Varner, fantastic. That, yeah, that's no, fantastic. absolutely. Fantastic listen. And then we've got, you know, the crazy Tony Galindo with the tell-all. I can't even explain to you how, like, how much my phone is blown up. That hasn't even sucked in yet. I mean, it hasn't even sucked in yet to me. <laughs> hey, dude, it's, it's ridiculous. I, I had Vernon White text me. So, I mean, that, that's like how kind of crazy – you know, the messages we've gotten from that. Um, but this is up there for me. It's up there for me because it's like, I don't think, like you said, not a lot of people know who he is, but yeah. you give yeah, this 15 minutes of your time, you're listening to, from beginning all the way to the end. And yeah, he's got, you know, he, he's, he, you know, he's got his Mississippi, you know, colloquialism there when he talks. Jamie Barner is a very different presentation, but they have that in kind, in my, you know, in common, in my mind, and that is kind of unsung heroes of the sport. Yeah. 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 Well, either way, ladies and gentlemen, like, share, subscribe. 
It really helps us out. If you listen to this, if you're listening right now and you didn't like, share, subscribe, or leave a nice little review on iTunes, you're kind of screwing us. I, I mean, I'm not, I can only, you know, thumbs up my own stuff, you know, so many times. If you guys can do it, it might push it through the algorithm and into the lap of people that might not know we exist. You know, we're about, let me go, what are we, about 140 some odd interviews in? Yep. Yep. The, uh, <coughs> Linda one was 141 for those keeping count. This is 142. Jason Knight. So, excellent. Thank you, guys. Appreciate your time. Jason Knight in the books. Check out the full interview on iTunes, Spotify, and all major podcast platforms.